This is Jocko Podcast number 356 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Gettysburg was a great battle. It's action, it's tension, it's hazards, it's consequences. In it were involved questions of gravest import, the decision of which makes history, interests social, political, moral, personal of gravest import for ourselves, for others, for our country, for man everywhere, for the present time and for the future for which also we hold a trust. The pressing question before us was whether we had a country, whether we were a people or only a populace, whether we were a mere chance partnership only holding only by human will or a nation constituted in the purpose and calling of divine providence bound together for the noblest ends of living by ties of mutual interest and honor bonds both of love and law all the great ruling sentiments which have their vital source in this idea patriotism loyalty self-devotion for the sake of others Nay, what we consider the supreme of earthly blessings, largest scope for individual life, endowments, powers, genius, character. These were the prize for which we wrestled in that terrible arena. More than this, involved here too, were the widest human interests. We fought for the worth of manhood, for law and liberty, which mean freedom for every man to make the most of himself with goodwill of all others without oppression or depression. We had a deep inward vision of this at the time, though unspoken and perhaps unclear, but no man, even now, can realize in thought or recognize in fact all the reach of good coming forth out of that struggle and that victory for the country and for mankind. And that right there is a quote from a speech by Colonel Joshua Chamberlain. And he was at a banquet to honor the 16th Maine Infantry and the 5th Maine Light Artillery Battery. And it was the 16th Maine who on July 1st, 1863, They were ordered to hold a position at Chambersburg Pike, but this element of men was eventually overrun. And as they were being overrun, they took down their flag, their regimental flag, and they ripped it to shreds so that it wouldn't be captured by the Confederates. And of their sacrifice, of their 275 men, 11 were killed, 62 were wounded, 159 were taken prisoner. But because they did that, because they held the line as long as they did, it allowed 16,000 other Union troops to retreat and regroup around Gettysburg. And of course, it was the next day, July 2nd, when the 20th Maine, under the charge of Joshua Chamberlain was able to hold the Union's left flank on Little Round Top with a bayonet charge that stopped the Confederates, the Confederate Army's best chance for victory in that battle and essentially at that point turned the, or at least started to turn the tide of the war. And it's no surprise in my humble opinion that these soldiers from Maine accounted themselves so well. They're from a state that has harsh winters, rugged terrain, and a culture of hard work and self-reliance. And today we have someone with us that has become a Mainer after retiring from the SEAL teams and is now looking to serve his country and his state again. His name is Ed Thielander, and he's here with us tonight to share some of his experiences and lessons learned. Ed. Thanks for joining us, man. Hey, uh, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, this is awesome. It was awesome to get out here. You know, I went out to Coronado last night uh, and watched some, you know, some tadpoles playing on the on the old course. 
<laughs> and uh, it hasn't changed much, you know. Uh, it, it's uh, that's one thing I missed from you know jumping over to the East Coast it was seeing these young frog, you know, men wannabes uh, just get after it and <laughs> and try and figure out how, you know how to negotiate the obstacles on their own time after training and uh, yeah and. and yeah, watching them run back and forth to chow. Yeah. You know, you run six miles a day just to go eat in boots. Uh-huh. Um, that's not counted workout. That's just to go eat. <laughs> yeah. And watching that was pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great to be back out on, on the West Coast. Check it out for a little while. And uh, I'll be popping back over to the East Coast to, tonight. Yeah, the O course is all fenced off now. Yeah, You I can't know. just walk out there and do it. Now, I mean, back in the day, a civilian could basically right. walk out there and just run the O course, yep. and now it's all fenced off, uh, which is a bummer, because you know it's kind of cool that you could just roll out there and run that thing. Yeah, that's a pretty brutal O course. Um, and we'll get into that. Let, before we get there, before we talk about your buds, your team's experience, and all that, let's start at the beginning. Let's start where you came from, where you grew up, what was going on. You're from uh, originally from Michigan, is that yep, right? Yep, Romeo, Michigan. Uh, so, so what was going on growing up? So, yeah, uh, born in Marquette. My dad uh, was going to school up there. Uh, you know, my dad did six years in the Navy, and then what did uh, he do in the Navy? He was uh, a missile tech. Uh, you know, subs. He wanted. He was trying to talk me into. Go be in a nuke. Dang. <laughs> That's a hard <laughs> conversation. <laughs> he's, he, he's telling me, yeah, you get steak and lobster, you know, and you don't even have to get up to get a drink, you know, because you know, people, yeah, that's because you can't get up to get a drink because yeah. it's so crowded. Yeah. And then you run out of fresh milk on, you know, the fifth day. And, uh, you know, they never turn the lights off or uh, in the hallways, yeah. you know, it's, it's uh, or I'm sorry, in, in birthing. In birthing, they never turn them on except once a week to clean, and and then they go in there and pull up all the deck plates and get food out. Did you, you know? ever do sub ops when you when you were in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was at SDV. Oh gosh, you know? okay, so yeah. I mean, which is just funny. Yeah, you know, team guys with nothing to do because we're kind of all ready for whatever we're going to go do, and we've got nothing to do except make jokes and, and uh, cause trouble. Yeah, you know, we were on the Dallas, and. Uh, we're the first ones, you know, getting ready to eat because we're ready to go do our little gig. Uh-huh. And uh, there's this little S turn, and so we all line up, and there's this pipe that sits right about head height, right about here, mm-hmm. uh, and we all lined up so you had to hit it. <laughs> um, but all all the the sub guys, no, they just you know shifted their head around it. <laughs> it was every diver and team guy that whacked right into that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that submarine life is is a different kind of life and yeah respect to the guys that do it i mean it's i could i i would i think the longest i was ever on a submarine for was like maybe a week and a half or something like that we were on we yeah. went on to go do some to go get inserted somewhere and bad weather came and right. they wouldn't launch us so we were just stuck there right that was my first experience with hot racking right you know you know what that is echo no hot sorry. racking it means when you share a bed with someone so like you're you're working one shift oh. when you get done i when you go to work i get in your bed so we share a bed yeah yeah, yeah. take turns yeah, yeah take Obviously. turns okay. yeah yeah it's yeah, yeah you can have two to three guys yeah uh, damn. Uh, not cool so so cool. When, when you get on with the sdv you know uh, the sdv is a little wet submarine for folks that don't know and they put this basically this garage on the back of a submarine and it, it is it, it's wildly awesome uh because you that whole thing is dedicated from moving, you know, uh, uh, two or six guys from point A to point B. This big giant garage door opens up. The, the SDV goes out, you know, 10, 12, 20 hours later, that thing comes back. Um, it, it's pretty wild. But we bring a bunch of folks on there to help us out and get everything ready. So they clear out a rack of torpedoes. And, and uh, that becomes your bar- your beds. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's just... So I gave up my bed to one of my guys uh, because I was getting off and he was gonna stay on and work the comms problem. And and I'm, you know, decent sized guy. I can't turn in under that torpedo rack because the next torpedo above you, I I actually have to squish my shoulders in tight. Uh, And and, uh, and they, in the uh, torpedo uh, area, they do, not turn the lights off yeah, ever. That thing's just always on. Uh, everywhere else, they kind of cycle daylight um, <laughs> in the work other working areas, except the torpedo area. 
So you're just in there, you know, they do put up a curtain. It means nothing. You're shoulder to shoulder, <laughs> head to head with, with, you know, whatever it is, 20 other dudes. <laughs> <laughs> and your dad's trying to convince you that this is the way to go. Yep. Go be a sub. Yep. So was he a submariner? Yeah, yeah. He did uh, and six And he was years. a nuke? No, he, he was, was a, a, nuke? Oh, a okay. torpedo man. He was trying to talk me into being a nuke. Oh. And, and uh, Those nuke guys, they work hard, man. Dude. It is yeah. no joke. Yeah. That job is a tough, grueling in the freaking nuclear engine room or whatever. Right. I don't know what you call it. The reactor room, right? right. God. So, oh. so to work out on a submarine. You got to put your dosometer on because you got to walk past the nuclear reactor, and then they've got it's they're all quiet workouts. They did have a square block of uh, dumbbells, you know, mm. uh, uh, which is you know they, they all wear tennis shoes so you don't make noise, you know, so you don't get no, no can hear you from above, and then it's you know it's an elliptical, not a treadmill, um, so you know you don't want to pound in other feet. Mm. It's yeah, you can do pull ups on something, and you got those dumbbells in, a, in an elliptical. Yeah, it is not Check. an ideal life for a guy that has a more of a propensity to be a seal. Right. <laughs> right. All right. So yeah. your dad. So what'd your dad do after he got out of the navy? So uh, yeah, he went uh, went to college up in northern Michigan, uh, Michigan Tech. In so driven in three years, working two jobs, he got his bachelor's and his master's, uh, and uh, you know, with with three boys, and then. Moving down to uh, Southern Michigan, teacher, electronics teacher. So, it was a good in high school, or high school, in college? Le- high, high school electronics teacher. Yeah, and it was legit. Uh, I, we were. He would do all this after school work and, and uh, weekend work with his kids, you know, his students, and we'd be in there climbing in and around all the electronic gear, and he'd have us making circuit boards. It, it, what I remember to be a ridiculously young age, a good, a ridiculous, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, like five years old burning circuit boards. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 we made stuff, flashing lights, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but it was all fun and games, and then all of a sudden we can do some wild stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, we were always forced to figure things out. I took electricity in high school with a teacher. I don't, his, we all, everyone called him Scotty. But that's where I learned how to like wire houses, you know? Yeah. And it, it, to this day, like, I mean, at one of my houses, I, this is when I was still in the teams, like took a weekend, redid, put in an electrical sub panel, redid all the wiring in my kitchen because it was all jacked Jack. up and like such a great skill to have. Oh, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's all stuck with me. You know, I, I figure stuff out. We never had a new TV ever. We <laughs> fixed all those old tube TVs, you know, and, and changed the channel with the pliers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we fixed our cars, you know, from fixing our bicycles when we were young, young. And then we got motorcycles, you know, little, you know, mm. YZ 60s. Uh, and we tore those down to nothing and put them all back together again. First truck, you know, that that was given to, to me to use. Uh, you start that thing up in a cloud of smoke and then we <laughs> tore the whole thing down, uh, you know, in high school on the weekends because they had a, a lift and all that stuff. So, so did you go to school where your dad taught? No, no. Um, he he was like like the the big high school north or south of us. Mm-hmm. You know, two thousand plus kids. We were like the 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 s- smallest of the big schools. You know, so so thirty two mile center of town was paved. Thirty three mile road was dirt. So we lived close to the dirt road. <laughs> <laughs> and so what when when you were in school? Are you into school? Are you getting good grades? Getting decent grades. You know, uh, uh, into the sports. You know, uh, football, wrestling, and then track. Kind of dropped track off at the end, and, and uh, just concentrated on football and wrestling. Uh, you know, like school, but not crazy into it. You know, like the math. Um, you know, decent grades. I was a B ish student. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, nothing, not, definitely not way into it. Were you thinking you were going to go to college or what was your dad steering you towards or your mom steering you towards? So I was getting steered towards the Navy college, Navy college, Navy college, you know, uh, my dad really, you know, went up to Ferris State University, division two school. It was a college. First year I was there, it became a university, whatever that jump Wait, that's is. where, that, so you did end up going to college? One year of college. Yep. Uh, and, and you uh, said you got a scholarship? No, oh, okay. no, 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 um, no, just uh, my dad went up there to introduce me, get me on the wrestling team, wanted me to, you know, okay, do that, you know, uh, good team. So uh, you're a good wrestler? Decent, 
You know, How'd you I do in high school state wrestling? Did not make it to states. Messed up my knee uh, in, uh, ended up having surgery on it. Uh, yeah, I just had like two thirds of meniscus taken out. Uh, when you're like 17? Yeah, yeah. So, so I had that surgery and in two weeks I went to wrestling camp. <laughs> <laughs> so was that your not senior year? Then. Yeah, that was my senior year. Mm-hmm. It, and then you healed up enough that you could go up and you walked onto this wrestling team at Ferris State University. Yep, and I was a red shirt. You know, I, I did not compete, but I stuck it all the way out. I mean, I start, we started out with like 90 kids and then there was like 17 left, at, you know, at the end. But I, I was a good weight for my coach. What uh, weight were you? Uh, 163, 165, whatever it was in college. So uh, you're just scrapping with the Yeah, our, our coach was, 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 you know, number one in the nation. You know, when I came out here to, to San Diego, his big rival, um, Butler, was, you know, they were number one, number two. I mean, my coach in college was number two, Butler was number one. Uh, and and uh, it was cool, because I was working out under Butler at the time. I would go work out at uh, uh, San Diego Community College oh, right and, and wrestle there, you know, where Dean actually ended up going. Oh, we had the same coach, a couple of years <laughs> difference. <laughs> That's uh, wild. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you say you only went to you only went to college for a year. Yeah, uh, halfway through, and I was on a uh, plastics engineering program. That there wasn't room for everybody to do all all the plastic classes, so I was on a waiting list. So I was taking my English, my math. I took a three hundred level metallurgy class as a freshman, and uh, I got out of there halfway through the year. I said, "Yep, I'm going to go do the option." You know, finish this year out strong, and then I'm going to go be a SEAL. How'd you hear about the teams? Did your dad tell you about them? No. Uh, Adam, I guess to say, yeah, Adam Blake, good dude, um, in high school, he was reading Men with Green Faces, uh, like the only book about SEAL teams at the time. And I go, hey, what's that about? He goes, oh, that's the SEAL teams, you know, blah, blah, blah. I go, oh, that's cool. He was trying to talk me into joining the Marine Corps with him, which he eventually ended up doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but I said, hey, how come you don't want to go do that? Oh, that's crazy. You know, that's so hard. It's not really possible. Check. And then so that put it in my head, that's what I want to do. And I'll go and do the college and then, you know, can't quit anything, never allowed to quit anything as a child, you know. Uh, so I finished the year out strong and I signed up uh, for the late entry. I worked out a little bit in the summer, did a couple of uh, triathlons, you know, because I didn't know anything about mm-hmm. what I was really getting. We, there were no books about yeah. it. There was nothing really. No prep courses, nothing. What did the recruiter say to you? Um, like, Come on in. Yep, sounds great. Looks like you're gonna make a great seal. Yep, great seal. <laughs> you know, think so, he tells everybody else. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, took the ASFAB and all that happy stuff and, and you know, smoked that, qualified to be a new, qualified to do whatever. Um, and. Uh, was your dad like, see, son? Could yeah. Be a nuke. Yeah, this he was still trying, you know. What did your dad say once you told him you were going to try and go on the teams? Uh, yeah, cool. But at the same time, hey, you, you really want to look into, you know, being a nuke. Mm-hmm. You, know? <laughs> uh, you know, being on subs is cool. You know, the whole steak and lobster thing. And, you know, you don't have to get up and get a drink. And, you know, they're all a bunch of good dudes. But, uh, yeah, I don't belong in a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> I get on the sub to get off the sub to go do something. And so, then, so, yeah. so did they have dive fair? Were you dive fair? I was a dive fair. That's yep. what I was too. So, so yeah, you get a guarantee to take, take a tryout yeah. <laughs> in boot camp. Uh, and, and then whether you pass that test or not, uh, you are in the Navy for six years. Yeah. It's a great recruiting tool. It is a great recruiting tool. And that's the... The, the SEAL teams is a great recruiting tool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, if, you know, they say that the, the, the attrition rate is like 80% people quit or whatever, something like that, right? right? But if you start taking all the people that came in the Navy oh. to try and go yeah. to the SEAL teams, I mean, there's most people don't even make it, you know, two buds. Or at least a bunch of people don't make it two right. months. So they're get, the Navy's getting a lot of a, a lot, lot of people. Well, just you know, Blue Angels. I mean, that's on all the commercials. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, <laughs> who there's, gets to do that? Seven of them or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> you know, and it's cool to be on the Blue Angels changing tires. Uh, yeah. uh, but but uh, that's not what they're advertising. Mm-hmm. All right, so you join the Navy. You have no. How's boot camp? 
you're no factor. You a wrestler? Yeah, no, like used to boot, boot camp was just something to go through. It was, it was pretty wild. To Did see. you go to Orlando or yeah. Chicago? Yeah, oh, oh that's Orlando. where all the dive fairs went at the time. Okay, uh, yeah, that's where I went too. So I guess it, that it, makes sense. It's wild seeing all these folks come from you know that that boot camp was a factor, like a wow factor. Either mm-hmm. the teamwork part of it, you know, uh, um, people getting authority uh, as a recruit that like. Yeah, you never have to. You should never have authority, <laughs> and then and and seeing people stressed out uh, about the you know, simplest of things, uh, um, and that was wild to mm-hmm. to see those differences in people. That that, uh, um, wow, you know. So so yeah, boot camp off the books. You know, boot camp, Navy boot camp is different. It's, it's a lot about isolation and staying on a ship. Mm-hmm. You're only allowed off the ship one time. You know, for like a recruit weekend or something like that. Uh, you have, you know, that's what the Navy's about. You're stuck yeah. on a boat. And the Navy's about like blue collar industrial work. That's right. what most of the Navy is. Sure. And that's why Navy boot camp is a lot about attention to detail, sure. you know, following directions to a T you know checking what you checking your work because you know if you're working on an aircraft or you're working on a engine or you're working on a parachute like all these jobs they're industrial jobs yeah and you got to be squared away at that thing you know as opposed to the army or the marine corps a lot of those are field jobs you got to be doing something in the field i mean of course the marine corps has aircraft mechanics and everything else too and so does the army but that the navy is vast majority of it is industrial work people that know how to work on engines people that know how to work on electronic equipment that's what it is right so that's what the navy boot camps geared to are. i think it's it's come a long way now if you go watch like a navy boot camp video they have a simulator in chicago like a ship simulator that fills with water and right, they gotta right. f- fight fires and so they, i think they did do a good job it looks like they've done a good job at making it more a little bit more combat related or at least like Navy war fighting to at least get you that mentality because you should right. have that mentality if you're in the Navy. So I think they've done a good job moving in that direction. But essentially, it's a bunch of industrial work that you're learning how to do. Yeah. You know, thick, thin, thin, thick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's at the t-shirt, the way you fold the t-shirt. <laughs> this is the Echo Charles. So when you fold the t-shirt for Navy boot camp standards, there's like a certain way to fold it and it ends up looking like there's a thin layer. No, then the, thick, oh, oh, thin, a thick thin, layer, thick. then there's a thin layer, a thin layer, and then another thick layer. And you got to learn this, and you do it, like following orders, attention to detail. Attention to detail. Yeah. Before you get to play with a nuclear reactor, we want to make sure you can fold a T-shirt. <laughs> Wait, what's thick and what's thin? I don't uh, know. It's the folds. Yeah, you know, the the, folds there's somehow. other material under there, so it, it, the, the first fold is thick, the next two folds are thin, and then there's another thick one. Yeah. It's just the way it is. It, it's just a... It's it's this funny thing that you know. I mean, I, that was 1988. Yeah, I don't know if they still have it, but I know Leif Babin still folds his shirts like in a Navy manner. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I was like, bro, he went to Naval Academy. What the hell? Was like, I saw his stuff folded. I was like, damn, what's going on over here? Yeah, you know? it's stuck. It, it it is a little attention to detail things, but you know, some of these folks couldn't. It, there was this brilliant, you know, young man, kid, whatever, uh, uh, and he wigged out in the end started crying oh yeah you, know, you definitely it, see some people wig out i mean there's no like, doubt about that wow <laughs> no doubt about you that know? i mean i understand it's some other things you know what i like i wouldn't have wigged out for that but i get it you know seer school and, and you know i didn't see anybody wig out in the teams but i saw them see wig out in seer school yeah. but uh not navy boot camp they yell at you yeah you know that's an expectation uh, uh should be you know but but uh some people just aren't used to that in their life you know and uh Wow. Yeah, I think also people get the impression that this is what the whole Navy is going to be like for the rest of my career. People are going to be yelling and screaming, and right. and you think, yeah, I can't take this and leave, or you know, no, they just want to make sure you can stand up to a little bit of stress because eventually something might get stressful. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so you get done. So do you go straight to buds after that? Where'd you go to A school? Yeah, Corman A. So, <laughs> so remember maps, right? Yeah. Your military and processing. Yeah, put a fifth choice down because I put all, all, I all, I only wanted to be a SEAL. You know, mm-hmm. uh, our source ratings, you had to pick a source rating because if washed out, you would go to the Navy and, and do that. Uh, so I put down, you know, three choices and an alternate. Well, I still didn't pick Corman yet. So I said, why don't you put down a fifth alternate? <laughs> <laughs> and so I got the fifth alternate, there core you know. school. But knees, it was knees of the Navy. Yeah, last easy <clears throat> class. It, it was only eight weeks. Uh, the next class shifted like 14 weeks. And, and uh, you know, trudged through that. And, and uh, 
off to what should have been buds, but they messed my orders my orders up and sent me to Balboa, you know, because they were like, we're not a my class one sixty three mm-hmm. didn't start till whatever it was April whatever, so they weren't going to get me there till like a week before, you know. But mm-hmm. you still had pre training, and they didn't care. They needed somebody to go work, you know. Somebody at the hospital was saying, hey, we need some bodies. Damn. So so they sent me there. And you know, I was working for a really good senior chief, and I said, "Hey, you know, uh, this is what I got going on. I don't think it's quite right." And, and you know, I'm just a new kid in the Navy, and I'm still like, "Hey, this isn't right. Um, can we check it out?" And so, I what I would do is I would go run down to RTC from Balboa, and I found you know uh, Senior Chief Billy Hill and, and Goward, and I said, "Hey, uh, you know, Senior Chiefs, can I?" get a little help here because I don't think this is right. And they go, yeah, that's not right. Go get, get your swim in, we'll fix it. And so they fixed my orders, but it took a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. So then I uh, I got to Bud's and a week and a half later, I classed up and started. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and you yeah. were class 163? Yeah. And you classed up a week and a half after you got there? Yeah. You said? That's a, that's a little bit of a quick start. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, I didn't know anything. You know, I'm seeing everybody, they're, they're, they like got their you know, that rope around their belt, uh-huh. you know, and say, hey, what's that about? <laughs> oh, yeah, we're doing underwater knot tying tomorrow. Check. Yeah. Uh, uh, you were know, you a good swimmer? I was a decent swimmer, you know. Um, you know, I, I sink like a rock. Mm-hmm. I basically, you know, beat the water into submission. If anybody has ever been a, tried to be a real swimmer, you cannot beat the water into submission and go faster. You know, uh, uh, it, it yeah. They you sound take like skill. you sound like my kind of swimmer. Like yeah. it's, a, it's like, me against the, it's me fighting the water. Yeah, <laughs> uh, somewhat vertical through the water plane. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I sink like a stone. But you were comfortable like knot tying when it did come yeah. down for knot tying. Uh, I and dove as a kid. You know, oh, okay, um, but you but you no know, knot tying. Okay, how do you tie that? You know, those series of knots. You know, right. I didn't know, and that, you know. That's what we're doing tomorrow. Okay, how do you tie those knots? How was Hell Week for you in your class? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, summer Hell Weeks, you know, just they're warmer. Um, you know, uh, uh, these these other guys that are thinner are they are gonna suffer before I was because I was I'm you know the mesomorph. You know, uh, I'm naturally heavier guy. Um, so basically, they kept that boat on your head longer mm-hmm. and you know my neck will tell you about that today still <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, uh yeah you know um remembering all the wild things about about hell week you know you know what was your worst you know thing in hell week tuesday <laughs> Two, so uh i was uh ryan zinke what was uh um our first phase officer uh-huh and at, at uh, chow times, eat four times a day. At chow time, uh, he would go around and make sure no one fell asleep. And if you nodded off, you were gonna get a jalapeno. <laughs> you know, so Ed being from Michigan and you know, roast beef and mashed potatoes, you know, <laughs> peppers like the ultimate spice and used sparingly. My mom's, you know, French Canadian. It, it's, it's a lot more bland food. I've uh-huh. never had a jalapeno in my life. <laughs> and your lips are blistered, you know. Uh, uh, so Ed eats the jalapeno, check. <laughs> uh, and I threw up. You know, it's a one mile run with a boat on your head. I threw up for a mile and a little bit because we ran all the way to the O course and we did the O course with our boat. Yeah. And I threw up all the way through that O course, hauling the boat around, and then I've got no fuel in the tank. Uh, that was a long, <laughs> long day. Yeah, I remember that. You know, and then remember the other things about you know hallucinating, you know, hallucinating, mm-hmm. you, know uh, you know, lion's lope, mm-hmm. you know, the, the uh, you know, getting mad at my paddle. I remember it though. <laughs> my paddle's not, you know, you know, making us go. I'm crying hard. You know that this paddle should make me go faster. You know, uh, uh, yeah. Remembering paddle prayers. You know, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> what's paddle prayers? So they would put us together around in a circle. Oh, so we have paddle above the and other guy's your, head. You got your paddle. Yeah. So you got your paddle so you're like this and when you fall asleep, it hits the other you try thing. and catch yourself and you whack the dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> is that in the program? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh you know, I was a really motivated young, you know, uh, uh, number one bow line man, you know, mm-hmm. the, the guy 
the guy that jumps out uh, on the rock portage and, and yep. anchors the boat. And yep. said, I wanted to be that guy. Yep. You know, uh, that's uh, the spot, man. That's the spot. Get in there. Let's yeah. do this. And uh, when that boat's upside down on your head, uh, that's <laughs> the spot too, because you're taking some serious weight. Yeah, uh, that's uh, a dangerous evolution in big waves, man. Good old and rock portage. You know, we didn't have helmets. Yeah. You no. know, we had K-Pox, you know, big giant, you know, horribly uncomfortable life jackets. Uh, and uh, wow, now they got helmets. You know, yeah. I, dude, I, I noticed they took the stump jump completely out now. Yeah, I but they, they reduced the stumps first, and now the stumps are all gone and they're tires. Tires, yeah. And that's kind because of, that's a mental thing, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, um, everybody knew the right stumps to jump on. It's just that all the fear of falling. Yeah. And I don't remember anybody falling. I, you know, I don't know that somebody fell and they hit their head. To, I don't know what the, yeah. It, it, Echo, this is on a, on the obstacle course. Mm-hmm. One of the first. Well, I guess it was this actually the second obstacle. You go across that dip bar thing. Right. Right. And then you'd hop off and there'd be telephone poles caught off at various heights in the ground like stumps. Yeah. And you would have to jump from stump to stump to stump and they'd kind of increase in heights and the last one was a little, was depending on which route, if you took the right route, which everybody knew, right. the last one was the tallest one, mm. had to jump a little bit further for it. And then you could jump, you jump up onto this, uh, grab this wall, this low wall, which was probably like 10, 10 feet yeah, tall or something, something like that. that. From the yeah. stump. From the stump. Oh, but yeah. it did take, it did take like uh, what's commitment, to right? Commitment to to jump from stump to stump. Yeah, yeah. And it got you used to committing. Yeah. Right. And now it's just tires, like you see on a football field. You know, you run the right. tires. Oh, Jay, yeah. yeah, you're right about that psychological part. Right, right. right. There, there's a fear of falling. It's just yeah. like you know, if you focus on the the stump that you might fall on, you're not looking at the stump that you want. Yeah. You yeah. know, like if you are you skiers. Yeah. You know, uh, um, if you ski with a helmet on, uh, and then you take your helmet off, there you see you ski slower, especially mm-hmm. if you ski in the trees. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're skiing in the trees, and if you're looking for the gaps, you're good to go. If you're looking for the trees that you don't want to hit, you're going to find that tree. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's the same kind of thing. It's 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 uh it's a psychological thing, yeah. you know, to, to get you moving forward. Yep. And they got helmets now too that they wear all the time, which right. is weird too. Because like even during Hell Week, they wear helmets. Really? Which is to me the agony of that boat grinding on your head was like a huge part of of what. Sucked. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That I mean, boat guys lost some serious because your you're, you're getting, you know, your head you're getting some serious sunburn. You don't have a whole bunch of hair. Yeah. Uh, it, it's yeah, it, your, your head's getting blistered. It, it's a psychological part of it, man. That that, uh, yeah. I don't know if I'd want to wear a helmet or not. Actually, yeah. I'd keep you a little warm. You know, I don't know. Any other? So once you got done with Hell Week, you're in the rest of Buds. Was there any other major challenges for you there? Um, <laughs> eating dry out at the island. <laughs> Would you say eating dry? Yeah. So you know, at, at at least one meal a day, you had to either do the pull ups, yep. the Frog Hill yep. run, or the rope climb. Mm-hmm. What pull- did you suck at something? Pull ups. Okay. <laughs> I could not. Yeah, gravity. You know, rope climb is fine because you use your legs technique. Uh-huh. Uh, um, but man, I ate wet a lot on pull up day. <laughs> uh, it, it was funny because because for whatever reason, I never did pull ups growing up, and, and uh, yeah, that was uh, no, the island was second phase for me. Yeah. Uh, then it, it switched it changed. eventually. Yeah, <clears throat> we're back to it, I guess. So. Yeah, eventually, I mean, I became a pull-up freak, mm-hmm. you know, as a big guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I, was, I think uh, uh, even after my shoulder surgeries, I did, you know, 26 pull-ups like six months later. It was like, it's a personal challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so so pull-ups was one, you know, running, not a great runner, you know, swimming, but, you know, you're swimming, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, yeah, the, not a top performer by any means, uh, but just kept going forward. You yeah. know, and, uh, you know, just all you had to do is perform, mm-hmm. you know, uh, um, pass, you know, but perform, you know, not tying, um, normally no factor. We did it in the dive tower. Well, how deep? Well, the ropes sta- same depth, uh, uh 10 feet. Mm-hmm. Zinke took me down to 50 feet <laughs> <laughs> and we just hung out there and looked at each other. And uh, till he was, you know, tired. <laughs> and then we came up to the top, and there is a set 
you know, it, it's all set what you're supposed mm-hmm. to be doing. Uh, uh, and uh, I was like, okay, yeah, you're ready to go? Yeah, ready to go. Uh, you know, and we went down and, uh, and then we, we came back up, you know, and, and bam, next knot. Then we're back down again and back up and down. Now, so I failed that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you know, that's one thing that's interesting. What I remember about some of the breath holding stuff, like 50 meter underwater swim. You're going right. to buds, you're like, ah, that's no big deal, I, I could do that. But, and not tying, oh, it's like, it's nine feet, go down there, tie knot. But you're in, in buds, because of everything that's going on, you're constantly like beat down. So you almost always have a cough, you kind of have a cold, you kind of have like right. mucus, you're always like that, you're always tired. Like, like a four mile time run. Four mile time run, first phase was 32 minutes four mile time run. You look at that on paper on the outside, you're like, well, what's that? That's a freaking, well, you know, I can right. do that, no problem. Then you get in there, you got boots on, you got pants on, you're running in the soft sand, and the run is not four miles, it's like 4.2 miles, 4.4 miles, 4.5 right. miles. Right. And then, and, and what'd you do the night before? The night before that morning, four o'clock in the morning, four mile time run, you did, you know, a thousand eight count bodybuilders, or you did buddy carries up right. and down the berm. So everything is harder than, it, than you think it's gonna right. be in buds. It's not what's on paper. It's what, what actually happens is harder. Yeah, no, uh, and you didn't get to eat, but you had to run to chow, and you had to go through the line mm-hmm. and touch the hamburger that you want to eat. Yeah. Um, but there was no time to actually eat it. You know, you wasted time running all the way, but you, that's what the, you must go there to do yeah, that. Yeah. But there's no time to actually sit down and eat. And then you run and you go do the evolution because you have to be at the evolution on time. Did so, you get rolled for anything? No, no. Just, First time every time. Yeah, it, it's, uh, um, mm. well, I mean, I failed that, but but my lungs were messed up from uh, from Hell Week. You, mm. Not yeah. tying right Same. after Hell yeah. Week. That's, that's, like, that's uh, the know. kind of thing that makes it hard. He's like, you get done with Hell Week, you're jacked up, man. Right. And now you gotta go do these knots underwater, and you're like, <laughs> you can barely even hold your breath for 10 seconds, so right. it sucks. <laughs> and, then, and then you get taken down to the bottom. Yeah, you know? and 50 uh, feet, going down to 50 feet is no joke. I mean, that's a, that's yeah. a, legit, that's a legit swim. Right. Uh, subsurface swim mm-hmm. that takes a that takes a decent amount of time just to get down to 50 right. feet right and now you got to do your little happy time and not with feet, a smile right? in the t- tower yeah the tower was yeah, 50 we feet, went to the yeah. bottom and sat did you see it's gone now the tower yeah 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 yeah, yeah that, uh, i drove around there just checking everything out and so but, what are you are you like a semen apprentice at this point or just yeah. an e3 yeah yeah you're just there happy to be there check yeah i mean you're <clears throat> Knowledge of the Navy, knowledge of, of what I'm, you know, other than I'm signing up, I'm, you know, I'm going to get to shoot, blow things up, skydive, scuba dive, serve my country. Hell yeah. You know, uh, uh, let's it, rock and roll. Let's ro- Hey, cool. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it uh, you know, they learn like um, pool comp, uh-huh. you know, th- that was another one where, you know, and I had uh, um, one of the mean instructors. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, it, and was he a senior chief at the time? Yes, he was. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 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 hey, great respect, you know. Um, but he ripped my mask off at the beginning, mm-hmm. you know. So basically, you, you got your your you got these old scuba tanks on with uh, flexible hoses that you can tie knots into. Not modern gear. They're actually soft, hollow. Uh, hoses, so you can tie knots into them to cut the air off. Uh, and uh, you know, he takes my mask off and leave, but leaves it on my head. And I said, "Okay, I'm not going to put it back on. I'm just going to keep." He's just swim back and forth. And you get to the end, you turn around, and while they're doing that, they're just coming in on you and, and wrecking your gear. And you have to do everything procedurally correct. And uh, I did everything procedurally correct, but since my mask was accessible. I should have put it on. Uh, Fail. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I had to do that again, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and, and I got even harder instructor. Uh, would considered harder, but fair in my mind, you know, uh, uh, a super dude. Uh, but he, uh, um, yeah, I got put through the ringer again. But but you know, I put my mask on when it was available. <laughs> and uh, lesson you know, learned. Lesson learned. Yeah, uh, I was a whole bunch of learning because I didn't do any of the. You know, well, they didn't teach you that prehand because that that was third phase for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I've uh, been there. And, you know, you know, back into shape again. Uh, it, it takes like a year, is what they say, to recover from Hell Week. Mm-hmm. You look at some of those cats. 
Um, and I remember, you know, I was a class corpsman, mm -hmm. you know, sending dudes to the hospital with encephalitis. You know, their hands are just, you know, big giant puff balls and their feet, you know. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, and we didn't get any sleep in Hell Week. You're supposed, they're scheduled to sleep, you know, uh, uh, but we did not get that. Yeah, I think the scheduled sleep might be a couple hours total, something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's two blocks of it, and you're supposed to get dry first. Um, they're, 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 well, that one I know my class got because they, you know, they tell you some story like, "Hey, the 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 skipper said we're being too hard on you guys. We we have to stand down for eight hours. You guys go get right. dry, and you guys can go to bed, and we'll wake you up tomorrow." And I mean, you know, it's bullshit. But right, right, you still, right. you put on dry clothes, and then yeah. you go, and you actually get in your bed. And this is probably like, probably Tuesday. Yeah. And and then you know, a half an hour later, they come in and they get you up and hit the surf. And right. But but guys quit because it's it's a smart move to get Ooh. people to quit. Oh yeah. Because they go into the comfort zone. Right. And then they bring you back out. You know, you gotta watch out for that comfort zone, bro. That thing will grab a hold of you. Oh yeah. That's like when you're doing a long ruck march. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, if you stop, you gotta stop for like five minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes at the most. Then you gotta get your ass up and start walking again because you start going into that 15 minute break, 20 yep. minute break, your body gets cold and you're screwed getting back up. Mm -hmm. But uh. Yeah, so I, we slept that point, and you know, you fall. Sometimes you're just falling asleep. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. You're right. just gonna fall asleep. Yeah. The, uh, so they got us into dry clothes, and we had a kid in our class that um, quit on Tuesday. You know, whatever twenty class or whatever. You know, years before came back, and uh, so he had knowledge up to Tuesday. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and so we, kind of, you know, he knew something about it. So we got dry, but then they put us on the grinder and uh, on the pavement where we worked out. And, and you know, we started doing flutter kicks. And uh, um, instructors up there doing our flutter kicks. He brought the class leader up there, and uh, had the class leader started leading us. And then the instructors walked away, and we're on our backs, we're in dry clothes. That's the standard. Um, class leader would not let us go to sleep. It's like, yeah, go, you know, he's trying going around making us say our social security numbers, our birthdays, you know, trying to keep everybody awake. And it's like, I, I, I go, and I'm, I, I am a kid, you know. And I go, you're doing the job for them. <laughs> and uh, uh, so then they, at the end, because they, they're, you know, in that first phase corner office mm -hmm. just giggling I, I i imagine yeah you know uh and then they uh let us you know said all right they're probably trying to figure out how to make that officer quit <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, the, this the, guy they, is too the, dumb they, they weren't gonna make that guy quit that guy's a hoss he doing the underwater swim you gotta swim you gotta swim tied up um and you gotta do a flip into the water and then you swim 25 meters flip and then turn around and come back without a mask on. Um, so he did it flutter kicking. Damn. Yeah, uh, no, 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 this is not not the tied up one, the one you, just the regular oh, yeah, underwater yeah, just swim, regular the 100 swim. meter um, tied up one, you know, uh, uh, but but you have a mask on, I think, on that one. Uh, but the other one, you didn't have a mask. He's flutter kicking it, and he swam off course, finally got back on course, made it there and back. It, it, hard, hard, so, hard to stone. Yeah, uh, uh, college football player, you know. Uh, uh, but yeah, so they put us put us to bed, and um, somebody had a watch hidden. You're not allowed to have a watch. You have no concept of time or day or anything. Uh, uh, and uh, you're always trying to figure out what day it is a little bit, you know. Uh, uh, you know, trying to remember what meal you count from meal to meal, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, so 22 minutes. That's what we got for Hell Week. Sleep. It's not a lot of sleep. <laughs> no, <laughs> legit. <laughs> so you graduate from Buds, and what, what did you want to go? Where did you end up going? Team three. You went to Team Three, right? Yeah, I went to Team Three. So you get the dream sheet, mm -hmm. and you know, I put like all. I, I, I wanted to go to Maine because I I, I love the snow, and I, and it was like, instructor goes, yeah, no, you can't do that. That's stupid because you can't. You got to go to a team first. You know, the, the, we have four billets up there in Maine. That's how I eventually got up there. Uh, but I put team, I want to do cold weather. I, want, I put team two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I 
put team four. I don't remember what else I put. But you put uh, all the East Coast teams. I think so. And the Navy said? West Coast, <laughs> SEAL Team 3. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had a great time there. Uh, uh, you know, um, the first platoon, you know, um, Mark Cam- Mark Crampton, Bob Edwards, oh, right you know, um, folks that you remember, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Miss Mark, you know. Yeah. Uh, Mark was uh, friggin' awesome, man. Yeah, dude. Uh, crazy. You know, we can talk about that, just the whole, we got to watch out. Mark, Mark, you know, say it, you yeah. know, committed suicide and, and uh, completely unexpected. Totally. You know, I mean, that dude was solid as stone. Yeah, and, and just, just an just awesome mentor guy. mentor to so many people. I mean, mentor, yeah. but uh, wow. Uh, uh a smile on his face every single time I interacted with him, which was sometimes right. on a daily basis, but I mean, for his whole career, he just always had a good attitude about everything. Right. About everything that was going on. And yeah, so it's totally unexpected. You know, he retired. He's yeah. been retired. He had been retired for quite a few years, maybe. What do you think? Five years, seven years, something like that? Something like that, yeah. I mean, he kept on just. Moving on up and doing yeah. good things for the teams and, yeah. and, and everybody around him. I mean, always uh, self motivated, self improvement guy. Always looking for that next thing to make him and, and everybody around him. Yeah, better. and helping a, and not not just the teams, but he would like help kids that were wrestling. Had like a wrestling right. club. He's just doing everything. Right. Yeah. No. So, but yeah, that was that was a uh, that was a great platoon. Um, you know, uh, Westpac. You know, did. Uh, uh, so where'd you deploy to the PI or did you go? Where'd you go? PI, um, PI, um, Penotubo hit. Oh, okay. You know, just after we left and we came back, uh, I came back with Foxtrot platoon, um, and uh, you know the ashes everywhere. You know. <laughs> so you weren't in the PI when Penotubo hit? No, no, I was not. You uh, came. How was the workup and everything? Your first platoon, being a new guy. What, what, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, you were you a take, corman. I huh? was a corman taking the hits. You know. Uh, uh, we had a good bunch of new guys, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, Gino Bam Bam, uh, uh, Ghost Man, Dave Casper, lost him to cancer uh, recently. Uh, I don't know if you remember, these guys were still around yeah, there at yeah. the time. Um, yeah, uh, just a good, yeah, uh, and, but legit, you know, we, you make a mistake as a, as a new guy back then, you know, you're gonna pay for it. I really didn't get too much grief I mean, one day out at Nyland, you know, with the old Nyland, mm-hmm. you know, with the tree of woe, and <laughs> yep. uh, they were, they were, you know, uh, tuning some folks up. I was on watch, you know, I was not touchable. <laughs> Dave, the ghost man Casper, um, they were going after him, and they chased him. He got up on top of the mill bands and, and the RSUs that were over by the fence, and that's there's a gap big enough to drive a semi tractor trailer and unload it. He jumped over that barbed wire and made it out into the desert and spent the night out there. Freedom. Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> right. right on. And then, so what did you do on deployment back then? Uh, you know, I, I deployed. A bunch of training, yeah. you know, a FID, uh, uh, you know. Uh, did you go to any cool countries? Yeah, uh, I, I had a blast in, you know, South Korea. Um, you know, we went to Japan, did some sub ops there. We did, uh, uh, shoot, where else did we go? Um, I mean, there wasn't a whole bunch of traveling. You know, um, golf kicked off. We, we deployed early. You know, I did not. We didn't do. Did you backfill someone that went to the golf or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, SEAL Team Five. Worst like, job ever in the teams. <laughs> hey, we just need you to backfill for the guys that are going to war. You're like, no. <laughs> so yeah, I missed out. Uh, you know, significant parts of the workout. You know, as, as a new guy too, and you know, and as a corpsman. Back then, we didn't have the training that they got now, yeah. you know, and, and I could have got some more of that, you know, uh, uh, but I mean, the first stitches I ever, ever did, other than on a, uh, uh, you know, a, a fruit, uh, <laughs> was my own knee. <laughs> we were work up out of Nyland, and they had uh, uh, a pistol course we were running, there was a pipe you had to crawl through that had bullet holes in it, mm-hmm. and, uh, you, know, you know, dug on my knee, and, you know, I, I, I never even used lidocaine because I was not, not taught that in core school, you know, and, and I hadn't been through uh, um, the EMT course where you got all that yet at, at this point in the workup. And so a whole platoon watching me because I'm the doc in the platoon. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, which again was just crazy wrong, you know, from what they get. A platoon guy now had more training 
a regular platoon guy oh, now for sure. than, than what I had there. They're so squared away. And, and uh, you know, I never <clears throat> tied a knot on a human, you know, a stitch. Mm-hmm. And so everybody's watching it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, figured it out. <laughs> yeah, Herc, Herc, uh, Herc, uh, Doc, uh, yeah, Doc Herc was, you know, supervising me. And uh, I figured it out, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> cleaned it, cleaned it out myself, uh, and that was, you know. But um, they, it, you know, we came back second platoon. We were like getting ready to get uh, Corazon Aquino's out, you know, ninety two time frame, mm-hmm. ninety one, ninety two, and that was that was a fun little, uh, you know, jump into the deployment. We jumped into doing that, and you you done the quick ducks where you're uh, um, in recoveries where you're driving right into the back of a forty seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were doing it in the back of fifty threes. Oh, that's wild. Tail rotor. Yeah, how's that work? That's got to be sketchy, <laughs> especially when you're by yourself. Uh, but I, you know, uh, what are they like? Hey, you got this. You drive it in there. We'll yeah. we'll wait. <laughs> yeah. So 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 we, you know, everybody goes out and uh, no big deal, you know. But they're um, it, it's uh, it's fully inflated, just about uh, or it was all in drive, take everybody on shore, and then recover back onto the same helo by yourself. Mm-hmm. It's 240 knot rotor wash from a, a, a 53. Yeah, so Echo, just to explain what he's talking about. So a CH-53 is a big giant helicopter, but it, you ever seen the helicopters that have two big rotors on top, right? Yeah. That's what we would normally do this on, well, that's called a 47, or a 46 is a little small, but a 47 is big. But the 53 has a tail rotor like a normal helicopter. So when you drive in the back, you're coming close to this thing for sure. Oh yeah, no, you, you come in, you're coming in at a 45 um, and you gotta make sure your, your engine's on tilt. You're coming in at a 45 to avoid the tail rotor because um, it's legit. Uh, uh, again, that rotor wash can flip that boat. I put anything extra in it uh, into the bow of the boat and I would lean forward and I'm holding onto the tiller leaning forward into the boat you punch through that and it's a wall when you get through it there's dead space so so you you've got a you've got to make a right hand turn and gun it one more time until you're and you're in and you're inside the helicopter <laughs> it's like uh, by yourself it's pretty wild to do mm-hmm. um and as a new guy i mean it's my second platoon mm-hmm. uh without a workup so that was that was pretty wild and that whole so th- those were air force spec ops guys mm-hmm. you know there was their big uh um, thing and it was uh, yeah we did exercises with those guys too in, in the Philippines um, you know the uh, the C-130 that they had um, it got shot by you know NPA or some farmer that didn't like them flying serving their yak or what, you know, whatever uh, uh, and uh, so it, it took a round through and through the plane we never knew they they landed it, patched it. Is their exercise, and that thing was back up in the air. <clears throat> when 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 an Air Force bird you know breaks, um, and it's in a nice place like Hawaii, <laughs> you're there for a couple of days. <laughs> we never knew it even got hit. Yeah, you know. And this is training again. I'm not, you know. It, it's uh, um, yeah. That was that was pretty wild. Now is this? Didn't you fall somehow? Like a th- oh yeah. What was that all about? <clears throat> Ouch! Just um, so I, I always went off to uh, um, Joshua Tree, uh, um, or I had a while to go climbing on the weekends. You know, uh, Lou Langless. You know, mm-hmm. taught me. We we're all in a um, Andy Rios, Lou. Um, who else was in the barracks? Um, you know, go off climbing on the weekends. You know, we, we were still in the barracks in the teams at that time, um, and so you know, off camping. And I was a pretty decent climber right off the bat. My, you know, my uncle up in Canada would take me climbing uh, once in a while as a kid, and uh, rare, rarely, but um, I just liked it. And uh, I went up there. No one, no one could go climbing with me. So I'm like, cool. I just go find somebody when I get up there. So I had the soloist. You know, it's a self belay device. You tie off to the bottom, and as you progress, you keep putting um, pro in. And it's a camming unit. Um, and I did like a five eight, and I funny I remember the names of the climbs. Uh, Mike's books. It's on Intersection Rock right there in, uh, in Joshua Tree, mm-hmm. and then uh, mm-hmm. I just hung dog this. I got to the top, set up a, uh, a top rope, um, making it safer, uh, and I would just 
did like a Mike's book is like a five eight, and then the next one was like a five eleven, um, which is above my what I could do. I was a ten C ish climber, um, so I just kind of cheated my way up on that. Literally, you know, because you can you can hang on your pro, or hang on your whatever. Yeah, well, you just pull on your rope a little mm-hmm. bit because I'm self belaying top rope again. Oh, okay. Um, get to the top, and and uh, you know, there, there's a. Uh, uh, lady that wants to go climbing with me. I'm like, check, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> so and it's all downhill from there. <laughs> yeah. So I throw my rope down and, uh, and I go do the down climb and I look up and there's my rope. It's caught in a crack. All right, I got to hurry up. I got the four pieces of pro that I set that top rope up with. And I climb up there, get to the rope, put it back through the belay device. And, and when, you're, when you're using that soloist, if you're off track, um, it drags. So I'm, I'm in this bowl and there's, a, uh, it, it, there's an overhang. So I gotta reach out and around. Um, and I was doing it and it's actually a pretty easy climb. It's like a five seven, um, but I didn't feel comfortable with it. And I had no idea what was really up above me. It was really, it was dumb. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so I said, nope, not gonna do it. So I jumped back into that bowl, but I took up the slack, and that one piece of pro that I set in kept my feet from planting, um, but it popped that pro, and I flipped out of there backwards. And I, uh, you know, I'm 40 feet up, and I, I come against the vertical face, I palm the rock, broke my left wrist, um, tucked into a good PLF, and I landed in this sandstone wash, and it folded me like a book. <laughs> Separated both my shoulders, um, chipped my ankle, and whatever else. Uh, um, that was a train wreck. Um, and there was a class uh, for guides just a uh, hundred feet away, and they got me the rest of the way down. And I didn't have far to go, and uh, I called. You know, and the ranger said, "Hey, you know." We've had a lot of people fall from there. They either land here in the sand because if I went, if I would have pushed off a little bit further, I would have landed in the sand. Probably wouldn't have been happy either. Um, and he so, said, "Yeah, they usually live. They land over here, or they land where you do, and they don't. Uh, uh, just by chance, I landed right in the middle of the wash. I was tucked into a tight PLF parachute landing fall. Um, you know, just not a recent graduate of because uh, this is my this is before my first platoon. Oh, okay, I was not going to not deploy." Um, so I didn't want to go to 29 Palms and get stuck out there. I called Gino up. Gino came, pick me up and, uh, with another team guy and, uh, you know, said, yeah, just drop me off at Balboa. I'll get it, you know, and they, you know, did a couple, you know, basically you get into going to Balboa on a Saturday night. What do you got? <laughs> whole bunch of colds, whole bunch of, you know, that's what they have for an option to get the kids taken care of. And, uh. And then uh, go up to the nurse. I thought you were going to say, when I've had to go Balboa on like a Saturday, depending on what time, it's like Saturday at two o'clock in the morning. It's like drunk sailors that are fucking oh. <laughs> fights, beat up. It's like such a disaster. No, this this is this is early uh, or late evening. Yeah, so you're uh, all right. They haven't yeah, yeah. gotten drunk enough to get end up in the hospital yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but I'm there, and, and uh, uh, the triage nurse, you know, says, uh, "Hey, I'm Ed. You know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I, I fell and I hurt my, you know." Got, I'm, I'm banged up. Whatever I said, mm-hmm. it was fill out this clipboard and come back to us. And uh, my neck is jacked up. I can't turn, you know. I, and I sit down and I start to think about filling it out. But I'm looking, you know, I'm looking like this, you know. I, I can't turn my head. And I go, I just stand back up and I said, "Ma'am, um, I fell 40 feet in a rock fall and my neck hurts, sir." Please don't move. And they strapped me into a uh, backboard. Went, you know, X-rayed my neck. Mm-hmm. You know, what else hurts? You know, it, this is ten hours after the fall. Everything hurts. Um, and they X-rayed me. They didn't find anything. You know, they didn't X-ray everything. There was more things that hurt than than my wrist and my my ankle. You know, uh, um, but uh, yeah. Um, later on, I found out. Well, so. I went climbing two weeks later with my. This is three weeks before deployment, but I. I had no strength in my left wrist. I didn't know why. Uh, uh, and my little brother wanted to go pre-deployment leave. We went up to Canada, went climbing. You know, um, young kid, uh, drive. Uh, but I deployed in, in, in a, I think, a total of three weeks. I got acupuncture like the next day because I could not raise my arms above my head. 
uh, you know, but I got acupuncture st- stick a needle in my shit from an acupuncture student in Coronado. So that's good. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> she was, uh, you know, uh, uh, it. Yeah. yeah, stuck a needle in my hand and my shin and uh, all of a sudden I can raise my hands uh, above my head. And, you know, I, so we went on deployment and I had to do, we had to do a PRT. Um, and I'll tell you it on camera here. I cheated. I did not do the pull-ups. I kind of cycled around, but I did the run, probably the slowest I ever ran, three miles at that point in my life. But I was able to pass everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, yeah, like, so wrestling tournament, the fleet comes into town and uh, um, carrier group. So they all kinds of activities that so don't go out in town and cause trouble. Get, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so I'm wrestling in this tournament and I, I re-agitated the break in my wrist in the first match. And then in the finals, I reseparated my shoulder. And uh, I, yeah, I bowed out at that time and happily took second. So I kept reseparating my shoulders like every three months. One left, one of the right one, left one of the right one. You know, uh, just a young kid, keep mm-hmm. moving forward. And uh, I was the corpsman, but I didn't really know a whole bunch. You know, so yeah, keep moving forward, keep going. Yeah. So what'd you get to do when you got done with that second platoon? At Team Three, so uh, <clears throat> second platoon. So in between uh, those platoons, I screened for for Dev Group. Oh, okay. And, and uh, uh, yeah, they said we don't want you as a corpsman. Can you cross rate? I said yes because I didn't want to be a corpsman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I could have stayed, you know, with more training and all that. Okay, but but I just want to be a you know archive team guy. You had to cover your own evolutions back then, and I never did because I always found somebody else to cover them. You had to work at it though, and I said I should not have to work to have someone else cover my platoon evolutions. That's just the way it used to be from mm-hmm. moons ago. Um, and, and so I screamed positive, I uh, jumped right into uh, 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 Foxtrot platoon, uh, did that, the end of their workup really, and then jumped right onto the deployment and uh, came back from that. and. Young kid, and, and, you know, uh, we never did a, a CQB workup. I made the mistakes I made, and uh, um, then they said, you know, so I didn't make it through. And then, mm-hmm. where do you want to go? And uh, you know, SEAL Team Four, uh, it, it, just because the reputation, and uh, um, I wanted to get to the East Coast. You know, so they, I think I put you know two and four, and they said they'd give me whatever I wanted. And I said, let's go go to four, and you know, South America, and uh, so I went and did that. And then you, you, so you show up at Team Four, just back into platoon life. Yep. Um, hey, can you deploy in two weeks? Check. <laughs> uh, have you? Uh, are you a six gunner? I am now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's your for, you're in your third platoon, and you get assigned as a pig gunner. Yep. Uh, uh, well, I mean, dude, as a corpsman, I wanted to carry the pig, the oh, medical yeah. gear, and everything else. <laughs> you know, again, happy new guy. But so so yeah, um, I, you know, I, I can work the pig. And so I went out and uh, bought myself some, uh, you know, 200 round uh, pouches and uh, figured out, made some gear up and off to deployment I went. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, they said, hey, can you be the diver up? Yeah, I could be the diver up. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I was diving since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, I dive, I think I qualified when I was 15 or 16, very comfortable in the water. Um, and, uh, yeah, so so we, I got dengue fever, bad deal. Um, well, so what's the deal with that? Yeah, um, you know, uh, get bit by a mosquito, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I got up to one hundred and six point five temperature. Yeesh. Bad deal. Uh, not at that point though. So we were in Panama, and I got. I didn't know what I had. I was just trashed. You know, uh, um, just hot spikes, um, colds. I mean, can't walking outside just to go put a piece of mail in the mailbox, you know, outside the barracks and I'm freezing and it's 98 degrees. Um, and then, you know, go back inside in the air conditioning and I'm just all of a sudden, you know, just up and down and up and down. Mm-hmm. But then I got better. So there's a trip to Columbia. Can I get on there? Yeah, throw them on the bird. <clears throat> when we landed in Barranquilla, um, and they literally kicked our pallet off at the end of the runway because it was a very hot area. Um, it just hit again. You know, I got better for like a, a couple of days. Mm-hmm. And um, 
we go, I can't remember, Trace of Skeeners or something, uh, the town we were in, and my fever got up to 106.5. And, uh, you know, as the other new guy, Corman, I wasn't a Corman anymore, but uh, it's like, you feel good? Uh, I think I'll get better in a little bit, you know. But, yeah, I either iced in. Luckily, we were there with the SBU guys, and uh, um, they brought an air conditioner. You know, we put an air conditioner in the building we're in. We're talking one dirt road town, mm-hmm. you know, that tees into the river. And, uh, yeah, that was... Uh, Does dengue f- fever stick with you for the rest of your life? Like, uh, not, not, You don't get this... Um, if you get it again, it's supposed to be really, really bad. Uh, but, no, it's not like malaria. Um, but, man, it takes forever to recover. So, on that trip, it's a month-long trip. Um, so, bro, this is why I don't like freaking travel, bro. I'll stay right here. <laughs> well, I don't like leaving America. My wife's always like, hey, let's go to this place. I'm like, Dude. no. Well, how about, you want to go somewhere? Panama. How about freaking Northern California? How about, you know, how about we go to Temecula? How's that sound? Yeah. Hey, she wants pa- to go to some foreign place. <laughs> Bro, I did all that. Yeah. I, and I didn't get dengue fever, and I don't want to get it. <laughs> no. I mean, a bad deal. Um no, from 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 SEAL Team Four, I've known somebody that's had everything. Like yeah, Leishmaniasis. So, uh, yeah, so back in the day, in in the nineties, well, even before that, the teams were geographically oriented. So, SEAL Team One was Southeast Asia. SEAL Team Two was Europe. SEAL Team Three was supposed to be Southwest Asia. SEAL Team Four was South America, and SEAL Team Four, you know, had had done the stuff in Panama, had lost guys in Panama, had. You know the the combat experience really right, right. of the of the era, um, so I can imagine that probably played into your mindset of wanting to go to Team Four and and if Spanish speakers were right. going to Team Four, right? And, and I mean there was still you know um, all the snowcap ops that they were legit doing, you know uh, whether it was just you know uh, sitting on a mountaintop with a radio or getting involved with the DA. I mean that was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this was one of those gigs where we were going in and training these folks, and then we were going to go in as a radio relay. Um, so at the end, we were going in as a radio relay, except we walked an insane amount. And um, and I'm the 60 gunner, Oof. and I'm weak as snot from from dengue fever. And uh, um, sun up to sundown, we did ridiculous so it's not it was not through the jungle it was through um the edges of open fields that had all these um lava rocks you know softball size mm-hmm. a little bigger smaller to get into columbia at that time frame the marines controlled the mill group so to get access to the country you had to go through the marines the marines were trying to build the riverine assault teams the rat teams so you had to take a marine fighting force with you you know an 01, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, staff sergeant, and, uh, you know, a corporal. Um, so we tagged on, and yeah, two stayed and back. And what, you had your platoon? Right. So or did you have a squad, or how, how many guys um, did you have? Th- this was a squad. Okay. But but then we had all the SBU guys, and we were, so we were training, the SBU guys was training their folks up, and we were training our folks up, and, and uh, you know, we were in the middle of 30 dudes, um, you know, plus on this, uh, hike <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we never saw anything mm-hmm. you know uh, uh, we went in the dry hole uh, and, and and back out this marine uh, lieutenant read a book where seals don't wear socks uh, and uh, that dude's feet were has wrapped just trash yeah bad 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 deal mm-hmm. Yeah. How uh, far of a hump was it? Ridiculous. <laughs> um, it, it was. It was. I. It was like twenty clicks. We yeah. walked from sun before sundown. We did two hours in the daylight, through the night, and then came up two hours after, uh, and we never stopped. We got there, dry yeah. hole, turn around, go. You it, know, it, the it, foot but it was thing, open field. You the know, foot thing like twenty k. You got to condition your feet for oh, yeah. that, like right. a lot. And then there is some advantages to it because socks hold water, and if you're like working right. in the jungle, you can get used to it, and you can be a good thing. But if you roll out for your first time, no socks on a yeah, but but, but, hump, but team bro. guys were doing that because they weren't walking anywhere. Yeah, that's that's another. They, thing. They, like, they're literally, I mean, swimming up the edge of the, the stream or the river, mm-hmm. you know, 
50 uh, uh, tops yards, if not 50 feet, um, doing the hit and back in the water again. Yeah. There was reason for it. Um, th- this was known to be a long walk. Yeah, it's uh, going to be a uh, problem. <laughs> yeah, no, his feet were n- not serviceable. So you're d- you're down there. How many platoons are you, do you end up doing at Team Four? Uh, three. And at one of the, one of these platoons, you meet your wife, right? Uh, in between, actually. Okay. Well, how'd that go down? Yeah. Uh, EOD's uh, explosive ordnance disposal guy married to a, a Spanish lady. My, Liliana was up in Virginia Beach, uh, learning English. No kidding. And uh, yeah, so so I, I was trying to learn Spanish. You know, I took a couple little, you know, classes on it, but uh, um, so I, you know, yeah, it was perfect. You well, know, well, and, and how did she get to be come to Virginia Beach to learn Spanish? She to knew learn English. Funny, she knew uh, another team guy's wife, um, and was going to stay with them. Ended up staying w- with uh, Cheese uh, Branquizio mm-hmm. and and, uh, and his wife, and then. However, uh, uh, the EOD uh, guy and his wife introduced us. Yeah. And uh-huh. she's from where? Venezuela. Okay. Yep. So she's got an interesting viewpoint on the oh, way things go down yeah. from a governmental perspective. <laughs> yes, she does. You see what happened to her? No, country. she sees it's coming here, man. She sees it's coming here. And uh, um, yeah, uh, we'll get into it later, I'm sure. But definitely the big push to do this thing that we're doing now. Yeah, that's got to be crazy. Um, yeah. So you end up. So you end up getting married to her. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, we got, we got married, and, uh, you know, I was always trying to not get married because I liked exactly what I do because I was always in a platoon, you know. And uh, um, and at this point, you know, um, still happy to be in a platoon. Our first, you know, first six months of marriage was, all, you know, I was in a platoon. I was on deployment. <laughs> uh, get back from that. And at that point, we still had – training um at the teams, at the teams. Yeah. and uh and so team four it used to just be rotate out do a stint in training and then back i mean it was it was really a crazy quick handover team four you know this is just before we started putting it to the groups and team four said no you're in training for 18 months uh which is right i didn't have to like it mm-hmm. you know uh so i was in training and mar ops i was like you know, and, 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 and diving. I was like, not what I want, but, but I made it. Uh, what I ended up doing with it is, is training it into, you know, even though there, we had turnover, which was, uh, you know, minimal turnover in platoons back then too. So we had a, a lot of folks could just do things. You know, you could do ops right at the beginning of platoon workup. It wasn't going to be perfect, but they'd figure it out. Mm-hmm. So I took um, my ops and basically we ended up doing um some down pilots with it uh and, and other things we you know it was any five and they just needed somebody in there they could you know because there was, wasn't any live fire in it uh although i did end up putting it in there uh, uh with uh pat the, the uh the guy running the, the the diving portion you know we were doing some sniper shots with uh diving our gear and doing some pretty complicated uh um you know we'd get the um Coast Guard involved, or the auxiliary, which really is your personal boat. You know, a bunch of older older dudes that that just want to do good with their personal boat, and doing indigenous. You know, we had a blast doing down to North Carolina and doing a live fire shot. You know, um, in town. Um, you know, two E fives. You had to bring us a chief on board to um, certify the shot was good and safe and all mm-hmm. that stuff. But we were just, you know, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, it was good. You know, made. Uh, uh, you know, Admiral Winters got involved with it. He was the, the, the captain, at the team captain at the time, and he loved it, and he loved the brief because I was always doing these curve balls in there, just not, not straight on. You get to have a happy, successful training mission. Mm-hmm. You know, there's always a, a curve ball, and I, he wanted, you know, I briefed it that way, and we did it that way, and uh, he actually had his brother who's, uh, I think, a uh, uh, Navy pilot, you know, a 14 pilot at the time, I think, and be the down pilot for us one time. <laughs> You know, we're doing a bunch of stuff out in town um, instead of just around the base and, mm-hmm. and you know, m- turning rectangles and triangles out in the ocean. We, we actually were doing ops. We went out to Ches Light, you know, over the horizon, launched off the old piece, uh, uh, the PCs, mm-hmm. and over the horizon, 
over the beach into Back Bay and all there was 75 nautical miles and they actually did a pilot recovery in uh, the intercoastal waterways on a piece of property that I was gonna buy and then later on a property that I bought, um, had him do reconnaissance on it uh, um, and uh, just try to, you know, uh, um, it, it wasn't gonna be regular old yeah. Mar ops. Yeah, that's, that's what it takes is guys that are going to take the training and just step it up to the next level. It's always what's yeah. awesome and, about and, the And teams. the next folks took it even yep. higher than that from me. Yep. And that's the idea. You know, always better, better, better uh, without getting too many crazy drift into it. Then you end up, you end up going to DLI, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my shoulders were getting really bad. Um, you know, I literally could move, you know, like refrigerator magnets around anymore. And uh, so I went out there and rehabbed, you know, that was the idea, the rehab's right there on the Did base. you have to get surgery? Yeah, uh, okay. so I, 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 I didn't Both get surgery. They, they, yeah, they wouldn't do it. Um, I wanted to do it right off that deployment and um, they wouldn't do it. They wanted me to do rehab first. And I got orders DLI for the basic and the intermediate. And I went out there with, this is 97-ish, mm-hmm. uh, eight, something like that. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, it, w- taking her out there without fast computers and these, you know, phones you can talk to, to translate for you. I mean, DLI's six and a half hours of Spanish a day, every day, um, and four hours of homework a night. Uh, it, and, uh, it, legit. I mean, I can, I, I can speak and, uh, definitely with, you know, my mother-in-law living in her house at some at various points and father-in-law, I mean. I got it down. And would uh, your wife speak Spanish to you all all the time when you got home from DLI? Yeah, like, I mean, so she spoke better English uh, when we met than I spoke Spanish. So our natural language together was English. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of like the go-to when my brain got tired. Mm-hmm. But but uh, yeah, for the most part, I could say, "Hey, how do you say this?" You know, uh, instead of you know um, looking it up in the dictionary and figuring out how to because you couldn't right now. You can just talk to your phone yeah. and it'll tell you. <laughs> So, so that was, and that was cool. It took you uh, about four months to get it to click, where you can actually go out and, and see, you know, uh, um, you know Monterey and, and everything else out there. Um, but man, that, that that was a great experience, and it was just us, no kids, that, you know, us and a dog. When you're spe- when you're speaking Spanish now, do you think in Spanish? I can, yeah, yeah. I have, I don't speak it as much as I used to. I am we right now. My mother in law is living with us, so it's it's back in the game again. Uh, cause it, it, does she speak any English? She does. It's it just it's never clicked with her. Mm-hmm. You know, um, she's older, and, and uh, she's always taken the, the the classes. I mean, genuine effort. Mm-hmm. It's just not clicking. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but she can't. She can get along, but she wants her brain to rest. Yeah. You know, it, it, <clears throat> if you go when you go to a foreign country and you are trying to speak in their language uh, to whatever degree you can, it's tiring. Uh, um, and uh, I mean, I've I can speak, you know, to the Cabo, to the Corporal, and I can speak to the, you know, uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, in Spanish, you know, and I have, you know, so it's varying degrees of Spanish, you know. Uh, what's the uh, MOJ? Ministerio de Justicia and Gobierno. It's like the Secretary of State and, and uh, Secretary of uh, Justice, uh, all wrapped into one dude. And you know, as a, a chief. Um, you get to talk to these folks and you're talking about how to develop, ra- you know, ranges in Panama or wherever. Um, but man, at the end of the day, your brain is tired. Because uh, uh, all the colloquialisms for the different countries, um, they all come into play. You say one thing in one country that, that means something else in another, another country and you can get yourself in trouble. You know, but, but it's a whole different animal once you get to speak. Uh, but, uh, so the total time at DLI was, well, how, what was the total time at DLI learning Spanish? Uh, 10 months. Yeah, I graduated the, the basic class early because the intermediate class was, was gonna overlap. And so I jumped into that. And then uh, um, again, it's just us two and, and a dog and a cat eventually. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, drove back across the country um, and uh, said, hey, my shoulders are trashed, so we cut on, uh, cut on both shoulders seven weeks apart. Um, as soon as I gained enough function with uh, my left hand, um, you know, they did the right one or, or whichever mm-hmm. one it was. Um, and I've had it tuned up since. I had another one done a few years ago. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, 
it's an ongoing problem. <laughs> and, we're, and then obviously you go back to team four after you get done with DIY. Yeah, I went back to team four um, and, and uh, yeah, I went into- uh, And Echo. you're a chief now? No. Oh, okay. Uh, no. Um, first class maybe? First class. Okay. But no, second class. I was not- not a rate grabber. I was not a. I, I was happy where I was. I mean, I, it was uh, um, happy with the leadership, you know, and, and uh, uh, not always completely happy. But uh, I always say it. Um, yeah, you know, you really shouldn't be. If you're happy with what's going on, hey, uh, and it's working. You're a team. Um, be happy with it. Uh, but when you finally decide at the end that you're not happy with it, it's kind of too late. <laughs> <laughs> so you're an E five, and now you go back to. Team four, yeah, and then jumping into another platoon. Your shoulders healed healed up enough. Um, so I was in Echo Platoon, knowing that I was going to get the surgery. They were uh, a CD counter drug platoon, you know, doing stuff mostly in the Caribbean. And um, the mass chief said, "Yeah, hey, we we broke you. We'll fix you." And, and it was just the with the idea, hey, um, you know, Ed squared away. He'll do the paperwork, whatever. Stick in the background. I got the sur- surgeries done. You get a month. Um, convalescent leave and I you know uh, I literally because I did the surgeries without any anesthesia just just the um, the, the nerve block mm. uh, off the table and went to the team you know to, to give them whatever paperwork and check them I, I was just an ex, you know I was excited that the chief said that mm-hmm. and I never took leave um, I just wanted to get signed up to start my uh, physical therapy I did physical therapy twice a day at work it, it, our, our medicals right in the middle of the compound and I'd get a full session um, and then I would get uh, um, like a partial session and then I brought my wife in they taught her how to do all the exercises I built a pulley at home uh, you know to pull my arm up and down I built a fingerboard so you can climb the wall with your fingers mm-hmm. and uh, I mean six months you know I did the PRT Yeesh. And uh, legit though, you know, they cut, so they did a fully open, they did rock blazes um, uh, the same week, same doctor, and they did his, they scoped his, um, but mine were pretty much kind of collarbones were tent stakes and, you know, kind of big pieces of cauliflower. So you wanted to get his big hands in there and trim them down. So they remove your deltoid. Hmm. Um, and uh, I'm awake and they have a Makita drill. <laughs> Check. <laughs> And they drill two holes at 90 degrees to each other and then lasso that thing and tie your deltoid back down. Um, so, so it's because they want to get in there and see it all. Mm-hmm. And six months later, uh, uh, PRT with, with uh, you know, uh, a very stern mass chief there that's very strict on pull-ups. Um, I, uh, yeah, 26 pull-ups, 105 push-ups, the whole swim and everything. So you were pretty much good to go six months later. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was tuned up and ready to go. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, into the platoon, you know, I, I, I even built, uh, you know, uh, before the all the cool Conix bo- workout boxes, mm-hmm. I uh, went over to SDV and got them to weld some stuff up, weld a bench that would collapse up and fit in one of those uh, ISU 90s. Nice. You know, built, built a pull-up par to go across the uh, the doors when you open it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, you should have patented that stuff. Yeah, buddy. Hey, you know, team guys are pretty innovative. Oh, you know, yeah, uh, sure. Dane, a guy in my second platoon, you know, he kind of invented uh, the the Camelback. Mm-hmm. You know, but what, he did. What do you use? Like an IV bag or something? What he used use? uh, a uh, two quart collapsible canteen and okay. an IV uh, tube. You know, and had it on his back. Uh, but hey. You know, you can, it's cool to come up with the idea. There's yeah. innovation, you know, it, 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 inventiveness and innovation. You got to get it to market. Yeah, maybe. well, there's, yeah, there's execution too. Because yeah. you got to be able to actually do it. Yeah. Actually make it happen. Right. I always, you know, um, this sounds so obvious now, but I was a radio man, right? Yeah. And so when I'm carrying the radio, I'd have my little flashlights and the you know, regular double A flashlights, little double A flashlights. You put yeah. the red lens over them, you tape them all up. So you'd be like, like a little pin like a little pinhole of light. Right, 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 right. But still, you gotta worry about the batteries. I mean, you do go like on a four day recon, You your batteries are gonna, you, so it's a pain. And I remember looking at the pilots with their lip lights, just the right. little LEDs. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, I wonder what that thing is. And then by the time the war started, 
someone made those little just LED click flashlights. I was right. like, oh, that's the smartest thing ever. Yeah. And I had two ideas in my freaking head and they didn't z- z- connect together right. to say, hey man, <laughs> it's real obvious. Here's a cool little flashlight you could use and, and make it into like something everybody could carry. Yeah, you know, and t- until, until somebody comes up with a limpet backpack, team guys were swimming with this bomb with magnets on their in their hands. You know, I've seen the drawings of that. Mm-hmm. You know, Rico, uh, um, he, uh, uh, and I think you know who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. You know, he uh, uh, invented the limpet backpack. No kidding. Simple idea. Yeah. You know, uh, where well, this a, team, a, a backpack that with a metal plate in it that you stuck this limpet explosive mine on it and you would swim with it on your back. Yeah, it's, it seems so obvious. So obvious because somebody invented it. Yeah. Uh, but, the chest seal. The Asherman chest yeah. seal. team guy. Yeah, that Asherman. Asherman. Yep. Yeah. Made this thing that everybody carries now. And right. it, it seems kind of obvious, but... You know, it's everybody was happy with a glove. Yeah, you know, like, or, or, or your, ID ID card. your ID card. <laughs> your ID your card. card. Like, That's no, what I was dude. taught as an EMT. Yeah, what a brilliant f- thing. Yeah, um, not everybody comes up. Well, sometimes you come up with a great idea. So you, so you made your ISU ninety. You're you're out there. You're out Get, ready you know, to work out of a box. Yep, yeah, and uh, you know, back with the platoon again. You know, tuned up, and uh, and you guys are doing counter drug. What was that deployment like? So was it just a bunch of little deployments? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, they had the CD money, you know, and then you named everything you bought was a counter drug stapler, you know, car. <laughs> 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 you know, it's a different pot of money, right? And, and you're going down and, and you uh, doing recons. What are you no, doing? No, we're we're just working with the locals. Uh, it, it's it's really fit for an internal Got defense, it. really, just getting them tuned up and and huge some huge exercises, and uh, like w- we would island hop for some of them. And uh, you know, do you know the Navy? Uh, the Army has more commissioned ships yeah. than the Navy, yeah. uh, which is pretty wild. The, the, our Army's a big machine, you know. Yeah. Is uh, it still like that? I don't know. Someone said it's not, uh, uh, and I no desire to yeah. confirm it or not. But it's just a wild stat. They it's have more helicopters wild, yeah. than the Air Force. Yep. I mean, they're a monster. They're, a monster. they're, they're huge. Uh, the big green machine. So we would island hop um, on their. Uh, LSU 2000, just a big giant landing craft. And we'd get off there and go stay in a hotel and go teach, you know. And and, uh, and then another year we went to Belize and they had us staying in the middle of a soccer field with countries, you know, and, and a line of outhouses. Uh, and not as nice. Uh, uh, Belize, the islands, you know, vacation land, inland, different animal. Um, and and uh, that was wild, you know. The, the, there were some countries that did not want to be there and they just wanted the gear and they weren't there because they were told. And, and uh, you know, that was like a hurricane disaster, um, giant exercise where, where, you know, you know, terrorists take over the, the local school while, you know, everything's going on and, and uh, huge monster exercise. My first, uh, my first bout with killer bees, you know, uh, have you ever done, seen the, uh, a swarm of killer bees? I think I've, no, actually, no. I've I've driven. Remember in San Diego for a while, Echo Charles. There was like bees. It's like so. <laughs> yeah, I've driven through sure. some swarms of bees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and I don't know if it was quite the murder wasp mm-hmm. or whatever those things were. Right. But no, I've not dealt with actual legit killer bees. No, cloud just coming really? across, and uh, um, yeah, one guy just screamed, "Get in the vehicle or lay down flat!" And this cloud came over the entire field. And then just went away. It was the craziest thing. Did I, anyone get attacked? No one got hit uh, significant that I remember. It was just the weirdest thing. We, um, but that happened. So they co- weren't really living up to the rep. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we, we were in we were in Colombia once, and, and and actually doing you know, kind of something you know, uh, uh, going in you know, uh, and uh, the locals sat down on a hive. An underground, you know, ground hive, and jumped up and ran and left all their guns. And I don't, you know, it, it literally. I mean, it was it was horrible. It was a cloud again, and and, uh, um, and we're in, we're in a bad spot. Actually, you can't be without your gun. Uh, uh, and uh, so I've got. Unless you're getting attacked by bees, then you said hell. <laughs> 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 yeah. But it's also where these guys live. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just. Uh, um, 
Yeah, just outside of Cartagena, uh, um, where, where you know they they take the the mothership down. That's you know it's a sandbagged big giant ferry, uh, and they take it down and in and then go in and, and uh, um, it's bad guy land. Don't drop your gun, but they did. Uh, uh, and so I've got my beekeeper's hat that I. You know, when you want to relax in the jungle, mm-hmm. um, you throw that beekeeper's hat on. So it's nice. your turn to relax. It's uh, so uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah don't so like nice. breathing the air back in on me, but hey, I'll take it. Yeah. You know, and I've got my gloves and I got the, you know, um, the tips cut off of uh, um, index finger and thumb and, and, and middle finger. And so Ed's going to go get the guns. And I, I've got my hands clenched hiding those little exposures. As soon as I reached out to grab a one of the rifles um i got whack 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 no it was kidding. a crate there yeah, they are just honed in and we smoked the area too to kind of try and calm them down the idea was i don't know how much it worked but uh yeah legit um <laughs> not cool <laughs> <laughs> so what happens you get done with that platoon so um i gotta fix my air you know uh, and i'm going i'm going back to green team and uh yeah, a uh, lot going on in the household at that time. Um, I was building a house. Uh, you know, I had drafting in like a half a semester in ninth grade. So I drew the complete plans to a house. Um, and uh, yeah, um, not a great plan. Uh, the, the house plan was great. Uh, uh, <laughs> the green team plan, not so much? Not at the, not at the same time. You know, her dad was sick in the house. So we had, we, our, our first child, um, you know, w- was being born all at the same time. And, and uh, you know, w- we're out at, at Shaw's doing a CQB. And, I'm, you know, everybody's taking a nap. And I'm talking to the plumber who's trying to put a bathroom in the closet. You know, literally. You know, uh, <laughs> you know. The city held us up back because, you know, um, the city employees d- disagreed with the, the guy with Ph.D. in dirt and said the septic field had to be this. And so it held everything back. Uh, and I'm doing this. I got 110 days leave that I took to do this thing. And I'm doing it in, in blocks. You know, I'm relinquishing, um, you know, what I'm doing uh, at SEAL Team 4. And, and uh, um, it, it just... You know, set a trip up, do the trip, take some, take two weeks of leave, uh, uh, and just knocking it out. Because uh, I'm talking, I'm digging the foundation. I'm, you know, uh, you know, I've cut trees down, milled the trees. I built the cabinets. I built from scratch the stairwell. You know, all the all the cabinets, all the window trim on the second, first, and second floor. Um, it cost a hundred and eighty ish thousand to build it, and, and uh, it appraised for seven twenty. Uh, sold it the next year when I'm up in, uh, um, or several years later. Um, so I refinanced it uh, when I moved to Maine because I didn't want to have two home loans. And uh, yeah, so I did the refi for seven twenty. Sold it the next year for six ten. Uh, put it on the market that day and sold in a in a day, a half a day. Um, so I did very well with the house, but smashing everything together, green team and the sun, you know. Tommy being born and, and uh, um, yeah, I went home to see him. He actually heard his birth over the phone mm-hmm. and then flew uh, into, to, you know, make sure everything's all good. I was supposed to try and be there. Uh, but on the plane, you know, pre-9-11, uh, yeah, not, not a great plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it worked out. You yeah. know? So uh, where'd you go after that? Uh, SDV2. Did you want to go to SDV? Yeah. <laughs> We were told we were going to be the snipers for all group two, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, you, you said you heard that too. <laughs> Got to tell all the group two oh. first. Uh, uh, <laughs> all kinds of interesting things. Yeah, uh, you know, SDV is awesome. Went to the SDV school, uh, um, w- which every, everybody there gets qualified to to, to drive that. And uh, uh, even though the plan was to be in the backs, just to get out of it and go do something and come back. Um, but uh, it's neat to go to the school, learn learn all of that. Um, I did a platoon there. You know, the war kicked off, um, and uh, we ended up. No one from the East Coast was going. You know, uh, uh, you know, we deployed with Team Two, and I think they sent a squad. You know, uh, at, at four they sent a squad to Afghanistan, and, and uh, no one was going. Um, and we went to Kosovo 
and we were doing reconnaissance there. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was some of it was a little sketchy. Uh, we we're getting to use some cameras and do some things. We were looking for some specific people. You know, some of it was walking around town, plain closed, uh, uh, which you know we really hadn't had anything at, at that point to just be a team guy. You know, in a foreign country. You know, uh, that was easy enough and really just. Were you at SDV when when September 11th happened? Yes, okay. uh, six hundred yard line of getting out of the van at sniper school, uh, and that uh, so you you were going through sniper school. Yep. So when you heard that SDV was going to be a snipers there. for everybody, you yep. said, "Oh, if I go there, I can go to sniper school." They like said you will go to sniper school um, right away, and uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, was, I mean. Sniper school, I won't say it was easy, because uh, it's not, uh, it's very difficult, but our workups at Team 4 were basically, a lot of it was, especially the, the basic warfare part, um, was mini sniper school. Mm -hmm. um, really good marksmen, really getting after it. You know, the month uh, of field craft, you know, uh, and then another month of land warfare, and then you get it all over again, back going back into the jungle. Um, that that field craft that you needed sniper school was all there. All, all the math was there for the shooting. You mm -hmm. know, it was all taught to us over and over and over and over again. So um, yeah, I missed Honor Man by half a point for sniper school. Yes, <laughs> that's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it, it was, uh, yeah, a little bit of love-hate relationship there because I was always trying to get um, the guys on the reconnaissance side more reconnaissance work mm -hmm. and, and not SDV support stuff, you know. Um, so then I became the LPO for all of it, you know, the whole task unit, and I had to shift and uh, be nice to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're, you, you, you fight for your squad, you yeah. fight your, for your platoon. So you, you were like a recce squad. squad. Yes. And you were the LPO of the recce squad at right. first, and, and then, then you became the rec the LPO of everything. Yeah, the whole task unit. And uh, that was a good shift, too. Did uh, you guys go on deployment somewhere? Yeah, we went to Spain. Uh, and, and from Spain, we went to Kosovo, uh, you know, for whatever it was, a couple of months, uh, just doing reconnaissance. But this we is post-September 11th. Post-September 11th. Uh, so we, you're freaking... Yeah, chomping at the bit. Like, like I went back to a team to you know go help out where help was needed, mm -hmm. and uh, that should have been uh, where the war was, uh, and uh, it was not happening. It wasn't happening for the East Coast for a while. Mm -hmm. The onesies, twosies, um, and then uh, then then uh, a buddy of mine was running the sniper school, uh, uh, good solid stone, um, and he said, "Yep, you come here, and we will send you over as soon as an opportunity." You know. Uh, so I went went to uh, um, you know be the scout course manager and eventually the, the sniper course manager oh, right uh, manage the compound uh, and yeah first opportunity you know deployed uh, to Afghanistan took my whole you know crazy sniper suite with me <laughs> and, and uh, thirty seven weapons <laughs> <laughs> hey it's you know yeah you you you're, you're mark eleven you mark twelve you're you know, you're, you're, you're 10 inch upper, you're, you're 16 inch upper, you're 300 wind mag, you're 50 cal sniper rifle, you know, you, yeah, you're freaking, you're Mark 23. Uh, yeah, name something else. And what'd you, what, who'd you attach to when you got over there? A SEAL Team 2 and the Siege of Soda, right on. you know, and I would just try and get out on everything I could get out on. Uh, you know, I ended up, ended up doing a lot of briefing too, you know, it wasn't as, as you know, cool as mm -hmm. what I you know was expecting, but uh, you should have stayed in E five, is what you were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it was uh, you know, um, but you know, I, I learned a ton, uh, and uh, you know, it was uh, happy to get out there and support and be part of it, and, and uh, it's it's a wild life experience, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, came back from that and. Uh, Finished up at, at, at snipers. I, I'll tell you what, teaching folks and and you know working the, with the cadre, that that's a wild, wild experience too. Because our sniper school is is legit. Our sniper school is awesome. Yeah, uh, and then and our got, snipers are awesome. Oh yeah, no, uh, that, you know Brian Sargent came on board. You know uh, shortly after I got back from, uh, and took over the the uh, sniper school, and uh, that was awesome. We just take it took it to crazy levels. Um, we were getting some 100% graduation rates, which had never been done before. You usually lose 10% per the major graded evolutions. And we were just How'd you guys get it to 100%? We, 
we learned how to teach better. Mm. And uh, we, we made sure the cadre was on the students, uh, you know, but we learned how to talk, to, you know, uh, you know, don't think I'm being soft. It, I, it, in the affirmative. Listen, man, I'm going to tell you right now, Brian Sargent's one of my, you know, longest friends in the teams. Yeah. And I know for a fact he was not being soft <laughs> on shit. He, he's not soft on anything. No, he's not uh, soft on himself and he's not soft on anybody else. So nope, if legit. he's saying somebody did it, they did it 100%. But, and, 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 and uh, yeah, learning, learning how to talk to people right, you know, assigning the right instructor, the right students. I and mean, we had the one eyed sniper, you know. Uh, oh, uh, Adam Brown? Adam Brown got, got shot in his dominant eye. Uh, and what is this team guy decide to do when he gets shot in his dominant shooting eye? I'm going to go to sniper school. Mm -hmm. Let's see if he's trying to get his eye healed, you know. Uh, uh, and so we teach him how to shoot left-handed. Hydro was became his, you know, who, who's a freak of a human uh, mm -hmm. fighting uh, brain cancer right now. Um, but a freak of a human and a crazy instructor and taught the dude to shoot iron sights left-handed and smoked it but he he cleaned the uh um the shooting test for you know with the scoped rifles both of them i believe that's awesome you know you're talking out to a thousand yards uh, um just pinging on steel uh it's incredible to watch and, and you know snaps and movers out to 800 yards um with a 300 wind mag at the time it was incredible you know but but patch you know hydro found what what he needed to say, how he needed to say it to him, you know, uh, um, and, and Hydra's always um, someone that's on top of the students too, you know, he's it, it, not gonna leave them and go have a sidebar with a couple of instructors, figure out what they're gonna do tonight. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and and the instructors, you know, a lot of them really wanted to, you know, it, it's not as hard as it was when I was in. I go, yeah, dude, it's harder. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you're just instructing better. And, and uh, so we, <laughs> We made up the, uh, um, this test uh, that wasn't graded, but we we under the training command, it, you get three strikes. And we don't think that's right for sniper school because you can't have a third, <laughs> third strike and a sniper shot. And so we had you know, a guy that made it uh, you know, his third, third time every time. We made up an exercise, basically brief the students in the morning, hey, pull your rifles out, this is what you're doing. We're gonna put you in a, an urban hide. And the base was awesome. The base worked with us so incredible on everything. I had a 20 foot bullet trap made on a trailer, mm -hmm. six and a half foot tall. Um, I made two of them um, that you could back together, get a 40 foot runner. So I would drive around the base and we had all the SDVs worked out, SDZ, uh, SDZs worked mm -hmm. out, um, where uh, they would shoot a blank I would back the trailer up to where that blank was shot and I would go stand next to the target and load a live round. And I would stand there with my binos, three, two, one, execute. And so we had to have trust that student would not hit the windowsill, not hit the fence or the tree that he was weak. This was short shots, 100, 150 yards. Mm -hmm. I mean, sniper easy shots, but not when you're under pressure. Uh, and uh, not for whatever you did the night before, the day before. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to be able to tell, you know, uh, parent command and say, hey, yeah, he did it. He passed everything, but let's, let's you know, uh, let's take a second look at it. He's not safe enough to do this evolution. And so I don't know where that went. We did it when I was there. I don't know where it went to after So where that. are you standing with your binos as this shot's Right next going? to the target. Like, like two feet away from yeah. the target? Yeah. Yeah, that's a high level of trust right there. Yeah. I did it all day. <laughs> <laughs> They're our, my students. Yeah, right? and our They're snipers my, are freaking awesome, man. Yeah, and yeah. you're not. I mean, so these guys are already qualified on the weapons at this point. Um, they've got some stocks to do, and you know, they got like 50 cal week to do. Mm -hmm. They're really qualified on the weapon. It's just whether the the question was, can that guy, when we want him to do it, make the shot first time every time? You know, because that's what you want for our snipers. But they were my students, and, and so. Um, I had to have the confidence in them to, that they would do it, and I did. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, um, I don't know. Sniper schools, you know, morphed throughout the years. Is all kind of just about the same. Everybody tries to take it up to another notch and, and make it better. You're always fighting with the parent command that wants more snipers through, and uh, you know, but we we'll always do it without lowering the standard. Yeah, the 
I mean, obviously, I, I had a I had 13 snipers in when I was a task unit commander, and like, what a blessing from God to have 13 snipers in the Battle of Ramadi. I mean, you just can't it, you just can't ask for anything else. So, and the performance was epic. You know, the the way the guys shot. I mean, I had guys take shots at at enemy fighters holding children. Um, right. You know, like and and. Use, using children as human shields, yeah, uh, and those kind of shots, shots through windows, uh, through vehicle windows, and just hitting the driver and right. no one else in the vehicle, like just awesome, unbelievable professionalism from the snipers. It was just outstanding. And you know, I always say, when you start when you look at the schools that we run, it's what you talked about earlier. You know, when you were running Mar Ops, you're like, hey, how can I take this to the next level? How can we do a little bit better? How can I get more people more squared away? When you look at seal breachers like the yeah. breaching school is just awesome the sniper school is awesome just the, the anything that you take a seal and you put them you let us run a course it's just going to get good we're just going to get better it's just constantly trying to improve and that's such a benefit for our community it's one of the best things about our community oh yeah the, the idea that um the peer pressure that you're not going to let the standard drop and that you are going to provide something that they've never had before. And it, I mean, your reputation in the teams is all you have. I don't care what you did yesterday. You, you do something stupid today, everybody's going to remember you for that. Yep. You know, and, and if you slack off and you get, you know, um, you make an easy training for, you know, jungle warfare, um, you're going to get called on it. Uh, uh, I mean, that, those trainings that we got, all of them. They've all been taken up another notch. And, uh, you know, the, the biggest challenge as a leader is to make sure they don't, you know, get out of the lane too yeah, much. Yeah. That instructor drift. Yeah. She's making stuff a little bit too crazy. Can happen from time to time, you yeah. know. Um, so you wrap up your time at sniper school. What's next? Um, then I'm off to uh, off to Maine. Ah, you yeah. finally get to, you finally, <laughs> finally get that goal. Well, I hadn't had shore duty in you know what uh, became 21 years a little bit, uh, and so uh, and I'm I'm kind of broken at this point too. You know, it, uh, ton of weight gain. You know, couldn't figure that out. Um, like how much weight gain? I was up to 275 ish. <laughs> Dang, was that does that ish mean 283 or <laughs> could be? You know, uh, uh, it, I just couldn't figure it out. My, my gut quit working. The anthrax vaccine, you know, um, that was a series of six shots, and all of a sudden, like I can have one beer, um, and I really didn't figure it out. We all went. We all went on the, the, the Atkins, the Fatkins diet, I call it, mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, when we went to Kosovo and, and uh, on that deployment. So I wasn't having any uh, gluten, you know, and when we got back, we went to. Uh, and what, what effect did the, did the Atkins diet have on you? Did you shred off a bunch of fat? We, we got crazy strong. Uh, um, and and uh, I didn't know what was going on at the time. So, and that was for several months did you lose fat though on the Atkins, on, on diet? The Atkins diet probably I just noticed we got really strong okay uh, um, I mean no real notice to the losing crazy amounts of weight that's the purpose of that I mean that right. guy Atkins it, made it, that it, diet and it for did people we, we, lose I lost weight. fat we grant you know we're eating meat and fat mm -hmm. uh, not to say that we followed it very strictly as far as I mean the whole percentages and all that uh, um, like I'm for the keto diet I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like a keto kook and I'm rigid uh, but definitely no bread you know no mm -hmm. gluten no beer no nothing no mm -hmm. pasta we go to Germany um, and did uh, you feel so you feel good too feel good okay uh, um, and then we go to Germany to de you know decompress debrief and uh, out comes the Hefeweizen <laughs> out for some pasta and beers <laughs> and boobling in Germany and uh, I didn't even make another restaurant I just started going, even, and uh, um, <clears throat> it basically shuts my gut down. And <clears throat> it was years. We didn't, you know, I went and got my gut checked out. Yeah, yeah, a little ulcer in there, you know. Um, yeah, still stress. I don't know, you know. I couldn't figure it out. Um, and I just kept throwing up all the damn time. It, it, it uh, and gaining weight. And I'm eating healthy, 
you know, I'm not drinking, I'm, I'm working out like a nut, and I'm just puffing up, the joints are getting, you know, your head's getting foggy. But at this point, you're eating uh, normal food. Normal, regular, healthy American diet. You know, uh, um, meat and potatoes, salad, you know, mm-hmm. pasta, uh, you know, and, and just couldn't, but, but it's all healthy. A ton of fruit. And what are you walking around at right now, weight wise? Right now, 205. So you went to, you were 70 pounds heavier yeah. than this. Oh, Damn. yeah. Plus, yeah. Uh, um, and this is when you get orders to go up to Maine? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I was, I was going to stay warm. Yeah, yeah, you those were. extra layers. Uh, uh, still, I mean, it's still strong, mm-hmm. um, but the swelling started, you know, um, w- with the joints and everything like that. You know, it, it, I mean, I'm dumbbell pressing 145s. I mean, mm-hmm. I was still freaky strong. Um, and that's that's picking up off the ground, sitting back, and then sitting back up again and sitting back in the racks. Legit, mm-hmm. you know, press. Um, that's funny because I always drop those whatever. If we're over one twenty, they're getting dropped. I don't know. I mean, that's <laughs> just me. Do it. Respect yeah. to the dumbbells. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. <laughs> uh, and, and no, um, it wasn't until I don't know maybe. So so we're, we're talking ninety nine. We got the anthrax vaccines, and they cut mine off at the fifth shot. They never gave me the sixth. Mm-hmm. Um, they just stopped doing it because it was causing a lot of problems for a lot of people. Uh, apparently it was a lawsuit too. Um, a lot of aviators st- had to stop flying, um, but what it did to me? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I got it. No, no factor. I never noticed. Yeah, it, no. So know? people are different, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it uh, definitely something there that caused something different for me. I think I got it when I went into boot camp though in 1990. Was it, is is that possible? I don't think it was getting pushed then. Okay, it wasn't the same one Maybe that they were giving the, the farmers. Yeah. You know. Okay. Dairy farmers used to get uh, or still get the anthrax vaccine, but not apparently not this one. Okay. Uh, and and uh, once I figured it out, the doc just said, "Hey, why don't you cut gluten out?" Um, and, and this is 2012 time frame, so I'm I'm walking around gaining weight and getting sore, you know, and crazy headaches. Uh, cut gluten out, bam! Instantly lose 25 pounds. No kidding. Yeah. And uh, kept on, you know, losing a little bit. And then I'm, now I'm a keto kook. Uh, I mean, I'm strict. Like there, are, there's no, there's no pizza night. Nothing. No pizza I don't substitute. Anything. Not even just ordering an uh, extra meat pizza and just scraping the cheese, pepperoni, and sausage off into a bowl and eating that. Because I'm known to do that right there. Hey, and that's all keto, go. and that's good to go. <laughs> I know it's good to go. Yeah, I do the meat pizzas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and. Uh, you know, with, with with a side of guac or something, Just you know, let's do butter this. in my coffee when I'm traveling <laughs> instead of MCT oil. Figuring out your diet's huge. Yeah, um, you've got to figure out something. You know, I never stopped working out, even though some things got you know caused me crazy headaches. I find something else to do. You know, find you know the, the blood flow restriction stuff mm-hmm. um, and some sort of suspension trainer. Um, that that will fire you up. You know, you use less the blood weight. flow restriction training. That's the cat was a katsu, right? Katsu, katsu, yep. k a t s u u, right? Correct. It's like a little system. You put it on. It's like a really strong. Uh, uh, what is that called? Blood pressure. Right, 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 right. Cuff but narrow that yeah, squeezes right. hard and cuts the blood flow off to your lip. Right. The idea is you cut it by eighty percent, and then you work it. Right, and then you work out with with twenty percent of the weight, so you're taking a load off your body, uh, but you're still getting a hard, a mentally hard and physically hard workout. So, so you're not causing all that stress and damage, and you're getting a legit workout. I mean, I, the thing I do is thirty minutes. I'll do some other stuff too, like a, with with the katsu bands. You know, you can do the rower for twenty minutes. Legit, you're hurting. Yeah, uh, um, you you mentally have to fight to finish. Um, especially your arms, because you can, arms you gotta want, you can cut the blood flow off, you know, your brachial mm-hmm. arteries are easier to get to than your femorals. Femorals, mm-hmm. you sh- literally, literally can't cut it off with a so- real tourniquet. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there's some training to go along with that, of course, you know, I mean, just don't go ahead and start, you know, <laughs> cutting blood flow off. You gotta know what you're doing. And my workout partner's awesome, Pat. I um, mean, legit, I was his client first, you know, as, uh, you know, taking care of my neck, taking care of my hip, you know, so shoulder rehabs, hip and knee rehabs, <clears throat> and uh, became a workout partner. And so I've got a pro 
um, that, that brought me into it, uh, the, the um, blood flow restriction stuff. And there's crazy Doppler systems that uh, a lot of it was, was pre-amputee, this one system, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's, it's four grand. Hmm. You know, but it actually has a Doppler tells you what your blood flow is. Oh, got it. You know, he was thinking of bringing something on board for clients. Um, but you have to, uh, you really have to know that it's okay because the pain you're going to feel in your arms, legit. Uh, and, and you question it. But <laughs> if you have this Doppler, it says, oh, it's okay. You know, if you, if you do your capillary refill, you get three seconds on, you know, then, then you're okay. You know, uh, and you just got to know you're not, it hurts, but you're not harming yourself. Yeah. Any workouts that cause questioning are good, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like that 20 to 20 rep squat workout yeah. that causes questioning of severe, life severe and like question. whether you want to be, you know, I've been doing that workout where I'm literally questioning if I even want to be strong, yeah. if I even want to be a man, I'm just like, well, maybe right. I could just hang, hang up on everything and just call it good. I'm just going to become a whatever some you know uh take on a different course a different path in my life oh yeah, yeah. so workouts like that are good yeah no no yeah i mean you've got to do something I mean, that's that's like the greatest thing about you have to have some little piece of adversity you know uh, and i don't care in maine you got to go get the mail and you gotta you know and it's really cold outside yeah and, and you know we got chickens or we had chickens uh, i'd like to get them again because kids got to get the eggs mm-hmm. you can come into the house when you get off the bus or you can go get the eggs and come in the house. But if you come in the house, you're still going to get the eggs and you gotta put your boots back on. And in the morning, before you get on the bus, you gotta go change out, make sure the water's um, you know, not frozen mm-hmm. or and replace it. Um, so it's a good it, little responsibility for them. Yeah, yeah, but it's a piece of adversity that's you know easy, easy to overcome. Mm-hmm. You gotta have something in your life that, that uh, you know, makes you make decisions. and. Uh, yeah. So 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 going back, you get this billet up to Maine, which for people who don't know, probably wouldn't why would you know this? There's a Sear School, Survival, Evasion, Resistance and Escape School up in Maine, and it's where the whole Navy is it just Navy? Is and, any, and Marine Corps and then you get a couple, you know, uh foreign nationals in there once in a while. But they come like for instance, air crew. If you're a pilot or your air crew, you gotta go up to this school and learn how to survive, how to evade, how to resist interrogation, and how to escape. Uh, I know I went, when I went to SEAL Team 1 when I was a new guy, the first thing they did was send you to SEER school, great. I went to the one that's out here on the, on the West Coast, and co- very, very good training, very thorough training, uh, very cool training, but you ended up being an instructor up there at that school, yeah. and you show up there. What's cool about this school, kind of like, being a buds instructor, which I was never a buds instructor, but you get a you get a glimpse into human psychology. Oh man! That that you know, I was talking to Andy Stump the other day. He was like debriefing me on you know he was a second phase dive and in, dive instructor at buds, and he he could just know when he's doing pool comp on something. He had all these different you know he could just watch the way a person's moving their body oh, yeah. and know exactly what they're going to do. Oh, he's getting ready to bowl. Oh, he's go- he's going to pass out. Oh, this guy's panicking. He you, you just see it over and over again. And so same thing at Sear school, we, you're going to watch people from a detached perspective because you're an instructor. You're not all freaked out or engaged in it. Right. And you get to see how they respond and you get to learn how to well, the interrogation piece is huge as far as human interaction. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, everything <clears throat> So we conduct training to 50 below zero. <laughs> and and uh, just the idea of that for some, and we, we modify it. You, I mean, you don't just do the same thing. Right. The instructor's uh, huge responsibility. Um, and you've got folks that have been cubicle warriors. They're pilots. They, they signed on to be a pilot or an air crew with a, mm-hmm. you know, a coachy seat on an airplane. Oh, they definitely like that. And, and uh, um, you know, you're not, you get some, you got some Marine recons to go through, you know, used to get SEALs go through, still do. Um, although we, like we've talked about, they, uh, got their own course now. Yep. Um, and they're doing some things, uh, that are legit. Uh, you, you know, you're making a snow cave mm-hmm. and that's where you're staying tonight and you watch people and this one, uh, he was, uh, you know, going through to be a C2 pilot mm-hmm. and he did not want to stay outside that night. And he was trying to sleep because you have these Adirondack shelters, which is actually going to be colder and you're cramped in with all these other people. But there's, um, it's off the ground. 
and there's no insulation under the floor, Freezing. so you're just you're gonna freeze. You mm. make a snow cave, and you're gonna be happy as happy gonna be. Your body's gonna warm it up. You just have to have the confidence to do that. And, and uh, watching somebody try and slow roll it, and I go, hey, tonight you're sleeping here. Whether you get this done in the daytime or you get it done at night, you'll be happier. Uh, uh, I'm doing you a favor. And you, but watching their their minds work, watching people try and attach themselves to people so they can get through, um, you know, uh, uh, like because there were still still team guys going through, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, people want to attach themselves to that team guy because they're going to drag them through. But if you can't do what that team guy is going to do, uh, uh, especially when you go on two brand evasion, um, you know, it, it's uh, yeah, it's it's wild to see. And when they are. Uh, in the captivity portion, you know, watching mm-hmm. what happens, uh, you know, either diamond people out, then you don't need, it's, people really get into the problem and they really, I mean, there's a little made up language, you mm-hmm. know, it's got like 150 words um, and, and uh, they don't come out of character at all. Yeah. The no, first time you see some actors. of these people, because they hide them, they come into the back of the building, that the students never see them in the classroom portion. And the first time they see him, they're in character. And uh, yeah, it's it's. Were it's, you guys doing the Eastern Bloc thing still? Yeah, man, they couldn't get away from it. <laughs> you know, it, it's a vehicle. Yeah. Uh, it, it, but I was like, I was you telling know, you this before the st- war is going on right yeah. now. I was telling you. I mean, uh, the first when I went to Sierra School, and you get you have to turn if you don't get captured by a certain time, you got to turn yourself in. They put me in the right. back of a truck. They pull us out. They put me against the wall. And this guy's like to ask me a question. And you know me, I'm freaking 19 years old, you know, just yeah. got out of buds, and I'm just like, you know, what's me. this dude's gonna do to me? And I gave him some wise ass answer. Barack. Right. He slapped me he slapped me as hard as as hard as he could. Right. I mean, look, I've been punched, I've been slapped many times, but I've been yeah. punched in the face. This was as hard you know, this was an open handed slap. Right. And he did it like three or four more times. And I was like, okay, I guess <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna have to freaking chill out a little bit because my bro right here is gonna be ready to get it on. Yeah, it, uh, basically if you're getting some extra treatment, <gasps> mm-hmm. then um, then you're not doing it right. Something, you know, because it's not yeah, about you're being a punk tough. as well. Well, from right. my case, I was, what I was not doing right was I was not being Correct. Uh, humble and respectful and treating the thing as, as if it was real. I was just like, whatever. Okay. Okay. 100%. I'm in. The, there's, you know, the, the the tough Marine mentality, you know, which is good to have, but you got to know when to say, hey, um, that's not going to work in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, using those tools and techniques, you know, to, to um, be polite, you know, and. and uh, Give me a rundown of interrogation techniques that you like. Um, I like the nice guy interrogator. I said I wouldn't go do the the the, the hard side, mm-hmm. you know. Um, basically, I taught the camping part first, mm-hmm. you know, and then I went and did that deployment we talked about. You know, I never been away from. Uh, we get in that later, but um, I, I, I I like the simple um, soft sell approach, just talking to folks, and it's really the way you order questions. You know that that read technique where you really give somebody a reason why they did something they did wrong. Uh, kind of give them a way out, but leading them to admit to something yeah. they did wrong. Um, it, it's uh, that, that soft sell is magic. It's really just a conversation because I'd be like the first person that they've seen that's nice to them mm-hmm. after they've you know uh, um, been slapped around been and all of a sudden you're being cool. And, like and, hey, I understand. Hey, you hey I understand. You you understand why you know you you've. Uh, been isolated and kept away from everybody you heard probably the coughing you know so we have to keep you away from everybody and we had to take away all your stuff and uh you know make sure you're all clean and good and uh you know and and there's purposely a camera with a red light on it that they can see Mm -hmm. and they're admitting to different things um (laughs) and it's 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 really it's wild to see um it's it's way beyond what a lot of the instructors think it is it's it's how to get through Roadblocks. How to talk yourself out of a ticket? It's how to, you know, um, it's it's everyday instances. Uh, it's a job interview. It's it's really sitting across the table right now and thinking <laughs> slowly. You know, sometimes if I ask a question, I might swallow or take a drink of water so I can think for a half a second and and come up with that, you know, better, politer answer. It's keeping that military bearing and uh, um, not, you know, being. Starting a fight, you know that that's uh, 
it helps you out a crazy yeah. amount. <clears throat> yeah, we've had some uh, POWs on here. Yeah, mainly from actually, I think all of them, all the POWs have from the Vietnam War, and it's incredible to hear their stories and what they went through. Right, and they came back and put injected their lessons learned into the Sears schools. Sure, and so that was awesome to get those lessons learned and just different breaking points. Mm-hmm. You know how long someone can take it and. You know, everyone's gonna eventually break, but you know how much you know how long you're gonna go. And even when they break, they give bad information or useless information and pretty heroic stuff. There. Did you say you went on a deployment while you were at Sears School? Yeah. Um, so originally, I was gonna go out the door with SEAL Team Two um, and, and uh, do my reenlistment there with them uh, and get you know get it all happy and tax free and mm-hmm. um, and. <clears throat> and uh, that got denied because I needed there at the school. You know, there's only a couple of SEALs there. Um, and it really, you know, there's some Marines there too, but then the rest are all air crew and pilots. That, that That's not what they do for a living. So, um, and then later on, you know, I kind of made a little bit of better stink about it, a little better sales pitch to go. And I was going to go on deployment with SEAL Team 8 to Iraq. Um, and it was all worked out. I was even going to stay there longer. I was going to really do some things see related there you know maybe not but i was going to be in a task unit and i was ringing my snipe yeah. <laughs> well i mean we were capturing a lot of guys through throughout the war and having you know at, at, a, at a point we tr- kind of transferred to having our see our own well not our own seals but other seals do interrogations and do intel right. gathering and they were freaking great man they were awesome yeah so it was really good to have guys that were able to do that kind of stuff yeah, and it's uh, and I, I probably wouldn't have been doing that, but actually working it out, you know, um, the pitch from our side of, of recovery. Um, but really, I was just going to be working with a task unit, mm-hmm. and I was going to be an extra gun and uh, work wherever I, I yeah. you know, um, worked it out with the, with the command master chief. Yeah. Have, have, gu- have gun, will travel. Yep, and uh, all worked out, ready to go. So I get re- I'm on my way down <clears throat> to Virginia Beach, and the civilian ops guy says, "Hey, we have this requirement in Columbia. You know, the the agency guys got wrapped up down there, and they're trying to get them out. Um, and we need a Spanish speaker." Okay. Uh, uh, so I was on my way down there, um, and they they, they got um, released. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, um, but I was already on my way down, so I went to go work with the Fronteriza, and you know was attached to uh, Debt South, um, and stayed down there for four months, and, and uh, that was pretty wild because I hadn't been to Panama um, since it closed, um, and uh, went into the Darien, you know, uh, just checking, you know, some things out, and, and uh, you know, you walk, you see a an entire boatload of gateway computers going, making its way into the Darien. <laughs> you can't miss those boxes, you know, the, 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 the white and black boxes. Oh, yeah. uh, um, and then you see a whole, you know, Cayuca, you know, dugout canoe load come of uh, empty uh, El Panama, you know, beer coming back out. Uh, um, a lot goes on in the Darien Gap, you know, where, where it's really a national forest. You can't go in there. Um, there's no vehicle traffic in there unless you, you know, narco terrorist. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, the, yeah, there's definitely a ton that goes down there. A whole bunch of, I'll, I'll leave it at different things that get funneled through. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, <clears throat> it was it was really neat to see and be part of that and try and get the Fronteriza online um, to, you know, help us out and, and keep things from coming north. So, and that ends up being your last deployment in the teams. Yeah, uh, and then back up to, uh, you know back up to finish my uh, time out uh, at Sears School. Ton learned though, watching the different interaction with, uh, you know, um, the Chinese that were down there, you know, uh, um, getting their fingers into everything, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I'll leave it at that. There's definitely some some, some work that needs to be done there. Uh, You say then next up is retirement, and what do you plan to do when you retire? When it's, so this is now 2009, you're going to retire, or you retire? Yeah, uh, uh, Chris, uh, New Year's Eve, 2009. Uh, start the new year unemployed was the plan. Got to go whittle wood in Maine. And uh, I had, you know, nest egg settled up. I didn't need to work for a few years if I didn't need want to, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, that never happened. Um, you know, the call started coming, um, and I started uh, – 
doing some training back with the teams. Did Just this. contracting? Yeah, uh, um, working the sit X's, working some different training pieces, ended up doing some some research test development stuff. Um, and then uh, then ended up going to Yemen, um, uh, not with the teams, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the contractor there, and, and you know, administrative the security guy. Um, and that was pretty wild because that's, that's the, you know, AQAP, you know, uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, hot, hot spot. And mm-hmm. we were right in the hot spot of the hot spot. So it, really learning how to use my words because we didn't have a gun. And, and uh, you've got a guy running around blowing up our wells. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, the stories are pretty weird uh, because they're that dumb. Everybody's <laughs> got to understand they're all stoned. Everybody in, in Yemen uh, cot. chews cot, you know, which is a hallucinogenic amphetamine. And they're all, you know, in the city, they start chewing it, you know, about 4 o'clock in the desert. They chew it earlier. In the desert, um, it, it's got a whole bunch of uh, um, different fertilizers in it, and, and it's it's it winds them up a little bit more. And so you try, you know, we don't want to get a um, – doing everything at the same time all the time you're leaving the gate you know um but you try and get things done in the morning because they're wound up in the afternoon and and so that's different and we got three different facilities we're checking out um trying to keep the oil flowing is the job Uh, your inner security is the tribe and the outer security and all the outposts are are the yemeni army Mm -hmm. and they hate each other (laughs) the yemeni yemeni army has a drinking problem they make their own hooch along with a cot. Um, and uh, the State Department contract for pilots, pilot training, you will not chew cot while flying. <laughs> so that kind of sets the base of if that actually has to be written in a contract. Mm-hmm. Uh, of, um, and and you, literally, we had millions of dollars of oil production slowed or stopped because they didn't get their tea and crackers. And literally, because the mm-hmm. driver guards want their tea and crackers. Well, their cousin hijacked the truck that has the tea and crackers in it and took it back to the town, Behan. And, and uh, um, well, tell your cousin to let it go. And and, <laughs> uh, and eventually just let him and haw on it for a while because the sharing agreement gets pushed to the right um, and, and they're not really losing money. It's just delaying it. Uh, and, and so you eventually resolve it. Hey, we'll, we'll go ahead and give you money to buy your own tea and crackers and we'll get, you know, things going again. Eventually they say, okay. And then eventually they come around and say, yep, um, we're happy getting the raise and now we want our tea and crackers again. It, it, it's, uh, but you get run down in the desert by a guy who just got, his brother got droned in the desert cause he's running around with Al Qaeda and, uh, his brother wants payback or his dad uh, uh, through his brother wants payback for for his son he wants his back pay because he used to work for the army um but he now he worked for al-qaeda when he got you know got the drone strike uh and and he wants back pay and medical benefits from the company because he used to work for the company also but he was blowing up the pipeline uh and, and the wells you know well one day he got it below the restrictor, the cutoff, uh, and, and so it wouldn't stop. You know, normally it'll just cut itself off the the, the, the fire. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got to bring wild oil in at like four or five million a day. Damn. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, uh, there's a bill, uh, and, and this guy runs you down in the desert. And there were a couple shots over your head um, to uh, it's kind of chest bump. You know, um, not really intended to shoot at you, but shoot at you pretty close. Uh, and they outnumber us and they've got better firepower. Uh, so you stop and you talk it out, you know, and, and uh, you know, hey, we'll work on this. And, you know, I, I make the fake glance in the air, they look like I'm looking for the drone. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, my security guy is like their cousin, you know, but he's sworn to take care of me and, and it's legit. Uh, uh, and there's two guys with belt fed, you know, RPKs and, and, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, you learn to use your words, mm-hmm. uh, and, and Sears school help with that. And I'm doing it through an interpreter too, you know, um, 
Hilo pilot or uh, Hilo pilot has a stroke um, that works for the oil company because uh, they're spiraling up, spiraling up to eleven thousand feet to get out of uh, um, the range of the fire. Because I'm there during the Arab Spring, and um, and the guy has a stroke. Um, that later that day in the chow hall and they come finding me, you know, Hey, Mr. Ed, um, you know, uh, he just had a stroke. All right, let's load him up and, and uh, you know, get one of our vehicles. He doesn't work for us. He works for a separate company. Um, that's not taking care of him. Like, I mean, those people are taking care of me and we're taking care of everybody. Uh, um, and so load him up, take him to the hospital. Uh, I didn't go, um, you know, just provided mm-hmm. what he needed. And then, uh, Next day, uh, Mr. Ed, they're not letting us into the hospital. You know, it's for this free medical care, but you got to bring your sheets and your food every day and go out in town and get the medicine that they're prescribing for you and bring it back. Hmm. Well, that day, um, President Sala got blown up, you know, and uh, one of the sheikhs that got blown up in that mosque was in that same hospital. So that tribe took over the hospital. And they've got it sandbagged in. They've got, you know, literally um, RPGs walking through the hallways, um, you know. Good built times. In, good times. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm this 200 and uh, probably 65-pound uh, white guy, at the, you know, blonde-haired guy at this time, you know. And then, yeah, lo- get me this, ter- this interpreter, uh, um, and uh, we're, we're going to the hospital. I said, hey. Here's what you're going to say. You're going to say it how I say it. You got to tell them that you're very happy that they're there. You're very sorry about their shake, uh, you know, getting blown up. And, and uh, we've got a guy in there too. You guys are taking care of your guy. We want to take care of our guy. Um, please continue to make the hospital secure, but we'd like to go in there so we could take care of our guy also. Could you please let us in? And it worked. They were getting shut down. You know, and mm-hmm. would not be allowed in. So we go in there, and, and it's a train. There you've got all these old overpressure blast folks that are just smoked. Um, and then this guy's in there with, you know, had a stroke, you know, grown man diaper, and not getting taken care of. And so we get them all set. They run out in town to go get the medicine, and and uh, I stayed there with him. And they come back, and they they call me up. I said they're not letting us in again. Well, what'd you do? Well, we, we just want in. Start all over again. <laughs> You're happy they're there. They're making the hospital secure. You're not really happy, but you're, you're telling mm-hmm. them they're happy. Um, you got your guy. We got our guy. We want to take care of our guy like you're taking care of your guy. And uh, up the, you know, then they come back in. And uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, the ability to find something, the common piece, your guy's hurt and our guy's hurt. We're happy you're here. You know, you're going through a checkpoint. You know, man, I'm happy you guys here. Have you guys seen anything? Is everything good? You know, is there anything we need to be aware of? You know, because you know, uh, uh, you're not happy they're there, but you you got to explain that. You know, get that, find something that that's in common that may or may not be. Yeah, build a little quick relationship yeah, with these little people. rapport. Yeah, uh, a ton of that. <laughs> yeah. So how many? So how long did you do that contracting stuff for? Um, it's just kind of continual since I retired. Um, you know, it really. Started working again for Brian, Sergeant, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and uh, he'd get me set up on all kinds of, you know, I won't name the companies, but it was fantastic. Yeah. You know, everything from going to the Olympics to the World Cup, living out in town with the athletes, and, and uh, school, you know, as team guys, it's, you, you're just not a monkey. You're, you're, you're setting everything up, squaring everything away, way beyond what security guy does, yeah. uh, and, and making sure everything flows smoothly, picking up, you know, gaps without dropping security. And security uh, is a civilian, especially executive stuff, is uh, you really have to have a really, you know, easy but hard mentality at the same time. I'm trying to look like somebody that, that, that you don't want to bother and you're going to go, you know, bother the other watch company, you know, uh, uh, it, because that one's not worth hitting. And at the same time, you know, they might want you sitting at the table with them when you'd rather not because that's not your job, mm-hmm. but it is to them. So you got to make a bunch of assessments uh, and, uh, you know, um, yeah, do some stuff you wouldn't normally do, but you do the assessment. And, uh, you know, it's uh, really interesting, super, super flexible. Um, and and it's, you have to be super personable, um, be able to talk uh, with, 
you know, heads of state um, that these, you know, top, I mean, I, I've been to F1 races um, in the absolute most, without naming the company, as good as it gets. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're talking to some wild people and, you know, they want to talk to you because you're the, you're the seal, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they're proud to have you with them and they're showing you off. I got a job to do still, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, so it's a wild mix. And, and if you are the grunty guy, because I was with uh, you know a, a rock band and, and who's really good people, are super you know, uh, um, yeah, just just that that was super enjoyable. But, but we got some, we're always augmented overseas by somebody else, and the folks that are um, augmenting us. Um, they just have this militant look about them, mm-hmm. uh, you know, including having sleeves rolled up and, and uh, <laughs> like, you know, uh, even, you know, cargo panty thing, you mm-hmm. know, pants and stuff. And, and uh, that's not the look we want, folks. In a lot of ways to, to do overseas, you know, I'm making sure the, the law enforcement that's there um, is uh, um, that they, they, and I don't know them very well, so it's you know because I'm we're jumping into a lot of things, mm-hmm. but I make sure they they feel right, you know uh, that that they're not nervous themselves, you know if you're there a long time, I'm making sure the driver is the same feel today as he had yesterday and the day before, you know so so that you know he wasn't threatened and told to make a left hand turn, you know when he's supposed to be going straight. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a ton of that. I t- I've talked to the clients a lot, you know to they need to build rapport and, and, uh, and be kind to their security personnel and their drivers and things so that, uh, you know, they love them, you know, their family, mm-hmm. because you're asking them to take, you know, when I, when I'm, it, it's the deal is I'm going to stick my neck out for these people and risk this father's going to risk his life for these folks. And so are those folks. Mm-hmm. So you better treat them kind and like family, you know? Uh, and I know a lot of these folks, they use us as a, you know, uh, they're a bit of a prop, you know, Hey, let's get going, you know, or, or interject here and there. And, and uh, it's, it's, there's some, you know, some of these guys are skilled sales folks and they're, they're doing some acting and, you know, you take it on the, yeah. Uh, but he knows that I know also, you know, so, okay. It's uh, again, it's a wild ride. And if you're not flexible uh, and you don't have a mentality that can roll with it a little bit, um, yeah, you're not going to be very successful at it. And I've had some wild clients. I really in, enjoyed that part. I like taking care of folks. Uh, and I'm, I'm, yeah, admittedly, I'll, I'll say I'm pretty damn good at it because uh, they keep calling me back, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and Brian keeps feeding stuff. And I haven't done it in a while. Mm-hmm. I started doing a lot of RD, you know, RDT and e research, test, and development with the teams and some other fun things. So, yeah, uh, you know, became a firefighter. You know, I'm a volunteer firefighter in, in all, or was rather in Alma until we moved from there. Mm-hmm. And then I became a uh, reserve deputy sheriff in, in Lincoln County. And so you're, so you're doing some contracting, you're doing some firefighting, you're doing some reserve sheriff activity. At what point do you get uh, roped in to, <laughs> to the political arena? arena? Yeah, uh, and I'm doing all that. I'm, I bought an excavator. I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm grading driveways and, and digging uh, foundations for folks. I'm doing some diving for folks. I mean, I've got all these things going on. I'm getting my, I got my private pilot license. I'm gonna about to start getting my commercial license. And yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, 14-ish months ago, uh, people have been asking a lot for us to get involved, for me to get involved in the politics uh, and because things are going sideways. Mm-hmm. And I kept saying, nope, nope, nope. And things got to the head uh, and uh, they asked again. Again, I said no and, and uh, I tell the story over and over. My wife said, yes, you will. Uh, her, she's been from Venice and, and she was, yes, 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 you will. We talked about it and her being from Venezuela and seeing that, you know, that, that leadership gap mm-hmm. uh, in Venezuela, you know, caused it to spiral down. People don't realize it was Venezuela. We used to get 17% of our oil from Venezuela, oh, yeah. more than any other country. I mean, yeah. they were they, they were uh, a wealthy country. Uh, and now they are, you know, again, j- just like the, the hospital in, in Yemen, uh, you had to go out in town and get medicine and provide your sheets and provide your food in a hospital. And there's no f- medicine out in town now either. You had to go to Colombia. Her family's a big 
part of it's originally from Colombia. Well, they escaped the narco state and went to Venezuela, and now they're fleeing back to the narco state. Jeez. They had to go to Colombia to get medicine for her uncle who was in the hospital. Um, and uh, yeah, we, hey, we've got kids, you know, uh, we've got two in college and one in high school. And they're where we're doing it. We sat down as a family and we talked about it. We had to make sure everybody was was good to go with it. Uh, and, you know, to varying degrees to, you know, uh, um, what does my 15 year old know about it? You know, he gets mm-hmm. it to a large degree. You know, he, he was, since he was, you know, that tall, you know, uh, uh, um, he was, dad, this is made in China in it. That's not right. You know, uh, uh, so he gets a lot of things and he gets this too, to a degree. Um, my older son's helped me write stuff, you know, he helped me write that pledge, you know, may take an ownership for the condition of our country because uh, I have not participated, you know, in this. I've always served, but never this. He helped me write that. He helped me write my first speech. No one can write for me. Uh, it all comes from the heart. I free flow just about everything uh, because it's from the heart. It's legit. Uh, you know, this is not what I would normally do, you know. Um, I say it over and over again, too, you know. I, I grade my church driveway. You know, I show up there when nobody's there, you know, and uh, I grade it. It's a, it's a steep dirt hill and uh, um, make it all pretty again, load my tractor up, and I go away before anybody comes back. And now I'm doing a selfie while I'm doing it. That is not who I am. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> Was there a straw that broke the camel's back as far as making you say, yeah, I'll do it? Or was the straw just your wife saying, you better do this? <laughs> it's all the crazy divisiveness, you know. In, in, in Sears school, you know, we actually taught um, how not to get indoctrinated and not how not to allow these divisions happen while you're a captive. You know, in, in the Korean War, there were 14 Americans that were taught in captivity that America's bad. And they did not, have these captors convinced them to stay in North Korea. Yeah. That's insane. Yep. That's happening here in America. How many ways are they trying to divide people? Whether you're vaccinated and unvaccinated, you're taught you're bad and evil if you're not vaccinated, and you're you know uh, you, you are taught you know uh, either you deny the election or you think that we need an election integrity to take a look at the election. You know, uh, th- then you're a traitor to the country. Uh, you, you hey, let's just take a look at it. Make sure the the people that think it was stolen um, understand it. You know, I'll take that's that that's an okay stance to have. All this division in the country is insane. It's not comfortable. Um, you know, uh, I've complained about it, and uh, it's the only thing I can do to, to make it right. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're stepping up, and we're definitely stepping up as a family. My wife is a huge part of the campaign. Uh, I mean, driving force, uh, and uh, couldn't do it. You know, wouldn't want to do it uh, without family buy-in. But uh, yeah. Um, it's a legit push, you know. I was going to go get my commercial pilot's license. I was going to do one more thing that was going to be fun. I enjoy flying. It's on hold for a little bit. What's been the biggest surprise about entering the, the political arena? Confirming all that divisiveness. <laughs> um, you know, because I, I walk up and I will talk to anybody. I go to these fairs, these uh, um, um, all the farm fairs and all that, uh, um, agricultural fairs, and... I, I walk, I give my spiel. You know, I always start with a, na- you know, a retired Navy SEAL because no one wants to talk to a politician, and I am definitely not that. Uh, so I said, hey, I'm at the Atlanta, retired Navy SEAL, running for U.S. Congress. Uh, you have time for me to tell you about the campaign? Uh, great. I did 21 years in the Navy, all of it in the SEAL teams. I'm a volunteer firefighter. I'm a reserve deputy sheriff. Uh, and never wanted to run for office. I'm running because I was asked to. And uh, the guy goes, oh, hey, that, that, that sounds great. Um, Who's the president of the United States? You know, <laughs> you don't have to like it, but Joe Biden's the president of the United States. And, uh, you know, he asked me, you know, was the election stolen again? And uh, I go, hey, we need to work on election integrity so everybody's com- comfortable with the results of the election. You know, whatever happened, everybody denies that the election, you know, Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, is still denying that her uh, election was legitimate. You know, the, the hanging chads in Florida, you know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we gotta have something. That man called me a traitor. Volunteer firefighter, reserve deputy sheriff, 21 years in the SEAL teams. I want to get check the election integrity so everybody's comfortable and I'm a traitor. Not cool. Uh, that, so a, a lot of that, uh, 
you know, uh, building the campaign's pretty wild. Uh, you know, we're, we're definitely money visits Maine. It doesn't stay there, so we don't get you know the donations are don't flow in. Although we're working our tail off, we're out raising. You know, somebody's been in uh, D.C. for 14 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been in politics for 30 plus years, and we're out raising her three to one in human money, but she gets 91 percent from PACs, and you know, so she's got smoking us in the uh, coin. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and mostly out of state. Uh, 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 that's a, that's a wild thing, you know, because you can look at all that stuff in the FEC website. Uh, that was the second quarter file. That's got to be uh, like. Just so crazy to think if you live in Maine, which obviously I got companies up in Maine, I'm yeah, yeah, by, you know, but and I, I don't live there. But if you live in Maine, you think that the people that are trying to get someone elected don't live in Maine and have right. no interest in Maine, but they want to want to change what people are going to vote for. That's right. kind of crazy, right? Yeah, and, and I don't know the right answer to fix that. You know, uh, uh, and that was actually started by a Republican. You know, uh, the super PAC thing, mm-hmm. which is, you know, they can do unlimited expenditures in your name. It's, it, no, definitely not right. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I'm definitely the weirdo. I'm going to probably go a lot, um, learning about who I am also. Because I've never put full thought into all these ideas that, that conservatives have. And now I have to because it comes out of my mouth <laughs> and uh, and it's on film or recorded forever. And, and so, you know, and it's also, you really have to think about, you know, just like when I was in the platoon and I became the, the recce guy, you know, squad, and now I'm the task unit, you know, over mm-hmm. the whole task unit. Those are all my folks now, you know? Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm representing all of District 1 and, and I will. Uh, uh, represent District One, so I got to think about you know what what's going to be right for everybody, and, and uh, you know I'll admit to fault. I'm not you know that's how we fix things. That's how we fix things in the teams, the military. If you can't say, hey, um, let's let's look at the result of that, and uh, oh, that might have not been the right thing. You're going to keep going down there, and re- politicians never do that. They yeah. never admit to, to wrong. Uh, uh, I'm I'm not that guy. I am not polished. Uh, you know, I've never run for office. You'll notice I um and hmm, you know and uh, <laughs> hey check. Uh, but I'm honest uh, and I'll keep my integrity. You know, I'll keep what my you know my beliefs and uh, th- learning a lot about you know um, me is, is is part of it um, because you really have to think um, your decisions are going to weigh. And you know, uh, and make affect lives. Yeah, it's crazy so. with the politicians. The um, number one to come out and say, "Hey, this is this is the right answer about whatever." You can say it about right, anything, right? And anything like, "Hey, this is the right answer. This is what we need to do." And then it doesn't work out as good as they thought it would, or maybe it's even bad or whatever. But instead of saying, "Hey, you know what? That is what I thought we should do," it turns out there were some other factors that were involved, and here's some adjustments we need to make. Instead, they just ride that parachute into the ground, right? Like, right. like, hey, this is the plan I came up with. We're sticking with it. And even when you come up with something, you know, I've been in leadership positions for a long time now. I mean, I guess for at least 25 years or something like that. I've been in leadership positions. And to, to, to say, hey, this is 100% right, everyone else should be quiet, is such a bad move. Yeah. Because the chances that you're so smart or that I'm so smart that I'm gonna figure out the best way to conduct this operation, or I'm gonna figure out the best solution to this business problem we're having, or I, I, I'm gonna come up with the, the problem solving move over here. The chances that I am just so smart that I figured all out. No one else can figure it out, but I figured all out. And by the way, when I figured out, I calculate all the variables in the future. Right. That's what I'm, I'm so smart that I figure out all the future variables and I get, I'm gonna get all those right as well. That's how smart I am. So why would you make statements that you're 100% right about anything? It's a dumb move. And then when you're not, which is okay, Right. Why would you not say, hey, you know what? Here's what I thought was gonna happen. Here's the plan we went with because of that's what I thought and that was the consensus and then it was wrong and here's the adjustments we're gonna make. No big deal. Right. No big deal. I've worked for bosses and I know you've worked for bosses that pretended like or thought that they had the 100% solution and, and then they won't back down from their decision 
even when it's wrong. And you, they think their respect is gonna go down, that people will respect them less if they say, hey, I was wrong. But it's absolutely the opposite is true. When I say, hey, I screwed this up, people go, oh, okay, well, at least Jock was humble enough to admit that he was wrong and he's gonna make some adjustments now. Nothing wrong with that. We haven't, politicians have not learned that lesson yet. Right. It, it's, it's the fear of the sound bite, uh, the, the fear that, you know, well, you should step down because you made that bad decision. No, I, uh, that was a wrong decision. I admit it's wrong. We're going to move forward. And, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make mistakes uh, and uh, I'll admit it and we'll figure something out to, to find what's better. But that's not happening right now. No. Uh, it's not happening and it's got to, you know. If anybody thinks it was okay to mask kids up um, that are, you know, born when this thing started and uh, they've never seen a human face except their parents for two plus years, that's insane. Yeah. Uh, th- that, hey, uh, uh, you know, the development's, you know, been slowed down in, in all our children. And uh, was that really worth it? You know, was that worth uh, shutting down businesses? You know, uh, uh, you know, we, we got, uh, Folks that that their business was shut down and they sold out and they're never going to open them back up again. And uh, was that really worth it? You know, while saying that everybody can go to work in the big box stores and, and you're actually having more people in the big box stores. Is that right? <laughs> you know, uh, um, instead of spreading it out to all the other stores while keeping them because that's, that's a human. That's that's that individual's decision. Yeah. And you go, look, sometimes you're in a, you're in a scenario you don't know what's going to happen. Like, hey, there's a bunch of people dying in Italy. Like, yeah. Okay, well, we're going to lock some stuff down here. Okay, well, okay, got it. And then like a few weeks go by and then a month goes by and you say, hey, it seems like in other areas of the world this isn't that bad. And, and all of a sudden you can't, you, you, no one says, hey, we need to adjust our thought process right now. Right. We made some rash decisions early on because we didn't know what was going on. And you know, if if you're my boss and you make a rash decision because you don't know what's going on and I don't know what's going on, I go, okay, well, hey man, I'm good. Let, let, let's give it a try because no one knows what's happening. Let's err on the side of safety. But then when you start seeing, you know, other information come in, and you say, wait a second, this doesn't seem like it's as bad. And we had people just holding the line on stuff that didn't make any sense. I mean, there's a, some kind of a there's something in California going on right now where the Indian casinos stayed open and the other casinos are mad. I, I, I don't know if I know enough about it to talk about because I, I saw an advertisement or read an advertisement about it. But the, the other casinos are mad that they were open and right. that they were able to make money. They said they profited when, when the other casinos shut down. And I'm like thinking to myself, Hey, if I was in charge of a casino and there was a bunch of casinos that were open and everything was okay, that seems like an indicator to me that maybe it's okay. Like when we had the Super Bowl in Los Angeles, California, and there was 90,000 people in the, right. in the arena and it, and it was no super spreader. There wasn't a bunch of people. And yet they went back to masks again. It was like, it's like, you can't make this up. Right. Uh, the, the roller coaster uh, of, you know, this is, you you must do this, and then you see the politician doing that, you know, doing exactly what they said don't do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and it's like, <laughs> hey, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's... It's very disturbing. Yeah. It's uh, very disturbing. And, and, you know, again, I have the, well, I live in California. Echo Charles lives in California, where we were like ground zero for the politicians saying one thing and doing something completely different. Right. Which you can, you know, uh, Americans will only stand for that stuff for so long, and it was actually longer than I thought. In many cases, it was, like, it was sometimes like, hey, hey man, like, I, you know, we we had a revolution against England right <laughs> like because they raised the taxes two cents on our bu- bushels of tea and we're like all right you know what that's enough we're done <laughs> you know yeah and and so there's only so much Americans can take uh, I think they definitely got pushed to the limit of that they took more than I thought you know yeah. especially as time dragged on but uh but what's what's really disturbing 
is just the decis- the decis- defi- divisiveness that you mentioned already, where it's like, well, it doesn't seem like in retrospect that putting masks on little kids was a good idea for two years. Right. And, and instead of people going, yeah, that, that definitely seems like it was a bad idea and we should try and learn from that in the future. Instead, they're like, no. Right. No. You're like, hey, man, what reality are you in? Right. What like, reality are you in? Well, watching them, you know, from afar dump sand in, you know, the skate parks out oh, here yeah. in California, <laughs> and, and, you know, put two by fours across basketball hoops. And, and uh, <clears throat> I was uh, up in, in uh, Baxter State Park. You know, it's a 13 mile ski uphill to get where you can stay mm-hmm. and sleep for uh, take a break. And then it's another three miles up much steeper terrain to where you're going to start to do actual, you know, um, ice climbing and, mm-hmm. and all that. So we made it 16 miles in uphill. There's nobody in the park. You know, it, it's uh, that's the cool thing about Baxter is, is in the winter is you cannot drive in there. Uh, you've got you've got very limited people, and they only allow so many people in there. We're away from everybody. Park ranger comes up, very sad. You have to go home now. We just made it here. <laughs> there's nobody. Yeah. There's nobody within, you know, fifty miles from us. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, you know, uh, uh, and so we had to, you know, ski out of, uh, uh, you know, back down the hill uh, of the mountain, and uh, that was so insanely disturbing. Yeah. And it came down from the <clears throat> Secretary of State, I believe, is what it, what they said. Uh, and, and uh, that was so, we, we were isolated. We were away from everybody. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of this has to do with the ecosystem that, a, that a, and really the digital ecosystem that a human being lives within. Right. Because I, I know people that were in the ecosystem of, you know, COVID was the most heinous disease that ever came right. to the world. And these are these are people that are friends that I know are normal yeah. like logical people, but their their digital ecosystem, the the word inside there, the truth inside that digital ecosystem was just so closed loop right. that there was no other perspectives coming in whatsoever, and it is it was very it was very disturbing to see to see people that their world was so closed loop that they couldn't comprehend another viewpoint at all. And part of that ecosystem was to protect itself from outside thought. And so anybody that offered some other perspective was immediately attacked. Right. It wasn't a car. You couldn't have a conversation with someone in that other ecosystem. You couldn't have a conversation with them about it because they would they would uh, go on the attack and they would utilize the truths in air quotes the right. the supposed truths from inside their ecosystem which they truly believed right that that they were true and it was it was it was honestly it was it was very sad to see it was very sad to see people going through that and you know i, I would try and address it a little bit with people you know um maybe mention to them something from the from outside their closed loop and, and and they would go on the attack and and go super defensive and it wasn't worth it you know i want to maintain a relationship with a person that i've known for 10 years or 12 years or 20 right. years you, you know you're, they're your friend and i'm not i don't want to fight with them over this thing it's like okay if you want to continue to live like literally quarantine yourself inside your house and we and we you know we met at an outdoor place to say hi and just mentioning that, you know, well, hey, just so you know, like I'm training jujitsu, right? And I've been training jujitsu with my friends and and all the time, and like none of us are sick and everyone's okay, and 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 just to see the look of horror in their eyes, almost as if, you know, I was one of the worst human beings ever. It was really sad. To, it was sad to see, but again, I think a lot of it has to do with. You know, you got to open up your perspective. You yeah. know, you got to open up your perspective, and you got to got to listen to more than one 
more than one ecosystem of information. Otherwise, you're not seeing everything. And look, you can go far to the other side of the spectrum as well. Right. And and you can get just as wrapped up in that ecosystem where you don't listen to anybody else. So it's it's a very strange time. And I think, you know, um, I, I always find that people run into a problem with their ego, right? Same thing that we just talked about if I'm a politician. My ego won't allow me to say, I was wrong. My ego won't allow me to say, hey, I don't know what to do, but this is what I think we should do. Let's try this. My ego says, no, you know everything. I know everything. I, I'm, I'm not going to make any mistakes. Well, the same thing happens when it comes to processing information. You get your root idea that you believe, right? and you don't want to admit, hey, you know what? I was, I was actually wrong about that. That was, that was actually, that wasn't a good idea. Or, you know what? That's what I thought a month ago. And clearly, there's new information that I should process and pay attention to. And people just, unfortunately, aren't thinking that way anymore. And it's like this weird tribalism that that takes hold. That's yeah. It's crazy to it's see. It's gonna be Rwanda, dude. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have to know somebody to actually know that they're different than you. Yeah. And uh, that didn't go over very well. No. You know, I mean, they had to know each other. What's going on with the lobstermen up in Maine? Dude, I tell you what. Just um, because I, I look, th- th- this is such a huge deal in Maine. What is this? A two billion dollar industry in Maine? Two billion dollars. Yeah. Two uh, billion dollar industry. This is, you know, when you think of Maine. You think lobster, right? right? Of course. Hey, I hope you think Origin USA. I hope you think about <laughs> making jeans, right? A hundred percent. I hope you're thinking about boots. I hope you're thinking about the best jujitsu gis in the world. Uh, you're gonna think about that stuff too. But before that, I have to admit, you're thinking about lobster because Maine is the is the is the the epicenter of lobster. It's the yeah. it's life in Maine. Yeah, and so what is going on? Yeah, no one, no one wants a Massachusetts or a Canadian lobster. Yeah, I've never right. seen an advertisement for fresh, fresh Massachusetts lobster. Right? Correct. No, they want Maine lobster. No offense to Massachusetts. No offense to Canada, but you want Maine lobster. So they're coming up with all these ideas. Uh, um, you know, the right whale up there, um, which is not even in the Maine waters. They haven't seen it, um, and it's they had an entanglement. Uh, Hold on, I'm just going to clarify this. So it's called the right whale. This is right. a, this is a breed of whale, right? And called it, the right whale. Yeah, it writes itself uh, when it dies. Um, it writes itself in the water and uh, uh, it floats. So you know, if there are a whole bunch of dead right whales, they're going to all be floating. You know, they actually, you know, history. Um, they used to um, chunk it up, you know, and bring it on the ship in pieces because it would be just floating there. Uh, and uh, that that's the other part of the one of the parts of, hey, it doesn't make sense what you guys are talking about. Um, they're coming up with all these ideas to, to you know, save the right whale, but they're looking at the lobstermen, and lobstermen are not the problem. You know, everything from, from the size of the pectoral fin, and they don't have a notch in it where, they, you know, the, the humpback whale has a notch and a huge uh, pectoral fin that would get caught in a horizontal rope. Um, all these things they want to do, don't need to be done. It's ship strikes that kills them, and it's it's Canadian snow crab gear that that uh, does it. The, the main lobstermen have done all these things to take care of it and get it out of the way. And so some of the things never... that they do, for instance, is they put like breakaways in the lines, right? So Correct. if I was a right whale and I got caught up in a main lobsterman's line, right? It's designed to break, right? And I get out, and, and I'm get fine. Out and you're good. And they've already done that. They've already done that. Well, all the ropes are all identified, so if it does get caught in a uh, um, main lobsterman gear, it's identified as main lobster gear. Uh, and they put several breaks in it. Um, it. It's it's all been done and taken care of, and it really was hasn't been a problem ever. Uh, but the the uh, National Marine Fisheries Services. They made a decision that if a whale dies in Canada, we take credit for it, or half credit for it. So one died there, and we're getting blamed, and we're going to shut down our industry. And no one made no, – they're under NOAA, right? What, explain what NOAA is, yeah. NOAA. Yep, uh, National Oceanographic Ad- Atmospheric Administration. And, uh, you know, it, it's everything from mapping and weather uh, in the ocean and – they have subcategories, and one is uh, National Marine uh, Fisheries Services. And they came up with this uh, 
study, you know, and, and if there's cryptic deaths. So if they get one death, they uh, assume there's three more, um, even though these things are going to float. And, and they stopped. They had they had crews that were uh, um, detanglement crews. Well, they disbanded them all because they're now entanglements. They had uh, you know observers out there. Well, they don't have any observers anymore because they're not there. Uh, still, they're trying to get them to modify things uh, in a manner that will shut the industry down. So, give me an example of what they, what the NOAA, the NOAA, what do they want to modify for the lobstermen? Um, they want to. They're they're really trying to get them to bite in and weigh in on the decisions that that are going to harm them. Uh, so, closures uh, of you know the prime areas. Uh, um, so, prime see, areas of where you drop lobster pots right and catch lobsters they want to shut them down they want to shut them down they want to try uh ropeless gear which is you know uh, in, in the short r- remote control a buoy pops up from the trap and you've got 10 to 20 traps strung out and you're going to count that this um you know you're dropping it in uh, no one's going to know where the the, the, the traps are because they you know you, you might drop them in six knots of current uh in a string and they're going to drop 150 feet uh, you know, you know, even even further. And how much does a a lobster trap with some kind of a radio activated or so was must be sonar activated yeah. to get the buoy to pop up? Yep, yeah, it's gonna be, you know whatever they end up doing. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, they're about four grand. Um, a regular lobster buoy, ten bucks. So who's gonna be able to do that? You know, it's gonna be big giant. You know. Uh, uh, um, you know, a uh, big box store, go Walmart, you know, China taking over our lobster industry. Can't happen. Because regular mom and pop can't do that. You know, uh, absorb that cost. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I mean, we're looking at getting another uh, uh, seafood processing plant built in Maine instead of shipping it uh, up to Canada. And uh, that's, you know, uh, just like the oil industry, they're not going to build you know, uh, another refinery because they can't have a guarantee that, you know, the oil industry is going to be around, you know, uh, just so they're not building that um, uh, seafood processing plant. There's a whole other, you know, slew of jobs in the construction and run into that that, that are gone. Uh, it's uh, it's going to have a crazy ripple effect uh, across Maine. When you people come there, you know, uh, you know, to, to go to Red's Eats and, and to stand an hour and a half in a line to go eat, you know, a, a lobster roll. Yeah, this is, like I said, I mean, when you think of Maine, you, you think of lobster, 100%. Yeah. So and, to uh, shut this down would be insane. So wh- wh- what will you be able to do when you're elected? Well, one, you know, the voice has to come out loud, you know, uh, we're going to look at, uh, you know, cutting funding, uh, you know, for, for the piece that's, that's causing the problem. Uh, they got a job to do. I got it. Uh, but if they're, if they're looking at it and if they're looking at the lobstermen and they're not looking at where they need to look, um, then they're killing right whales by, by, you know, accusing the lobstermen of, of being the culprit. You know, uh, you've got to, once you focus in on one thing, you're not looking to take care of the problem. You know, the, uh, the it's ship strikes uh, and, and a lot of pleasure crafts and folks trying to get too close to the whales, uh, but it's, it's, it's not the main lobstermen. It's uh, snow crab uh, traps way up in Canada. And, uh, you know, we get accounted for, like I said earlier, a uh, uh, death there. Um, to, that's insane. And that's... That's America doing it. That's NOAA. That, that's uh, National Marine Fishery Services doing that. Why? Why is this happening? Okay, so if I'm let's say let's say I'm a, let's say I'm I love animals, which I do. Mm-hmm. Let's say I love whales, which I guess I kind of love whales. I mean, whales are they're cool. Whales are cool animals. Yeah. I mean, I can I can see them from my house, and it's awesome. You know, I look out and we can see them spraying, and we see they they come they come pretty close to the lineup sometimes surfing. It's wow. pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, so let's say I, I I do. Whales are awesome. Mm-hmm. I want to protect whales. And then I start going, oh, well, maybe these lobster traps could kill them and that seems bad. And then I start doing the research and I see that they can break out of the lines if they get tangled because we put this yep. into place. I see that they're counting, what'd you say, mystery deaths? Cryptic, they call it cryptic death. So if there's, uh, they find one dead, they say there's three more. Okay, so now I say I've got, I'm, I'm multiplying 
when I start pulling, running the numbers on this, it doesn't make any sense to, to do that because this whale floats, so why would we say that it's dead? So as I start looking at this, I start saying, oh, this doesn't seem like it's a problem. Let's focus on you know some other issue because right. apparently, the because it's, it is apparent that the lobster traps and the lobster men are not the problem. So why are they not making this connection? Why are they continue to go down this path which there's evidence, clear evidence that this isn't a problem? Well, because you can't have windmills where you're lobstering and they want to put windmills in those areas. And uh, hey, if they make sense, cool. Uh, right now, they do not make sense. And, and you don't make up a lie, you know, even, even if it's right, the windmills, but you make up a lie to, to make it happen, oh, that's wrong. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying that the reason that they want to do this is because they can put windmills out there? Uh, yeah, can I say that 100%? Because, um, but that's where they want to put them, you know? And, okay, and, so uh, you're saying there is a plan to put windmills yep, out in that yep. section of the ocean. And, and, and uh, um, it's the... Uh, they're, they're, they want to do it on the sea mounts, the mountains in the sea, because mm -hmm. that's where all the, the sea life goes, because mm -hmm. uh, you put the shortest chain uh, on mm -hmm. those. These are three to one ratio chains, um, nine foot links, you know, <laughs> and 50 fathoms, you know, uh, I think it's 50 fathoms, you know, 300 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and uh, that's going to rake and destroy the bottom. And they're, you know, um, and then they're going to run horizontal lines. Um, you to know, get the power back? Yeah, to get it, well, to, to string these things together. Uh, and, uh, you know, that'll catch a right whale uh, because they get caught in their mouth. And all, all the pictures that they keep showing of the right whale with, with entanglements, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's never been our, our lobster gear. It, it's, uh, it's bigger braided line uh, and, and not the problem. You know, it, it's... Uh, yeah, you got to really look at it, it. None of it makes sense. You know, none of it makes sense. And, and no one's going back and saying, hey, let's reassess this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, it should have never gotten to this point. They're looking to start to shut things down next month. You know, hey, we're going to do a lawsuit. Yeah, well, it's getting shut down. Who, who's doing a lawsuit? Uh, they're saying that the state's going to. Uh, um, uh, they, the lobsterman did one uh, uh, and, and took it to court. And it's um, it's uh, all the cryptic uh, deaths and the you know we were us taking credit for half of theirs. They want a ninety percent reduction in in, uh, um, in deaths. Yet windmills, you know, the new vineyard wind farm uh, down in uh, in Mass, they get to do uh, twenty takes. It's level B harassment, which is Wait, what's twenty takes. What does that mean? Taking by, by level B harassment. You, you, you can harass them, and if they, it, it gets taken, uh, you had permission to harass it. So you can, you can stop them from breathing you know, by, by not allowing them to come to surface. Uh, you can uh, stop them from mating. You can stop them from sheltering. You can uh, disrupt their uh, migratory path. So what, you can do all that to the whales? The, the, the windmills so. can. Because they're they're going to do some blasting, they've got to do some sonic testing, um, just the vibration of the you know what what is the windmill itself going to do, uh, and, and if you multiply that times all the windmills up and down the, the coast, that's more right whales than are alive, as they count them, you know. So again, it doesn't make sense. It's not about the lobstermen, you know. Uh, take a look at it, uh, and everybody jump on board. You know, because, uh, you know, they're, you know, it, it's so frustrating. It, and, and you can look at me as crazy as you want because it's that crazy. It doesn't make sense and it's moving forward. <sighs> crazy. That's why we're running. Yeah. You well, know, because there's a, so much that, that uh, you know, we've just got to, and I don't know what I'm going to do. It, you know, I, I'm, I know I'm going to butt heads in my own party too because um, I'm, I'm that guy. Uh, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense, you know, and it's about the country, you know, uh, it, it's, it's never about your platoon. You're going to fight for your platoon, your task unit, your team. But in the end, you don't do anything. That competitiveness in a platoon and a task unit, it, it never supersedes your, your task, uh, uh, in the country. You know, I love the competitiveness in, in a platoon, 
you know, it's it's awesome because you're all fighting. You all be, want to be the one, you know, when when the building's burning, um, you want to be, you know, the squad that gets called to go in. And uh, you don't, you know, firemen don't want the fire, uh, but they're all, all, all the men are competing so that they can be the guy on the team that goes in and helps, right? Um, but you never let that competitiveness, you know, it's, it's, it's like taking, you know, politicians are like taking the firing pins out of, uh, uh, you know, the rifles so so that they 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 look better than the other guy you know uh you know it's it's like a a a sales team you know um you know cutting the cord to the copy machine before the other sales team gets to print out their their briefs you know it's um that's the competitive that's going on in in politics it's um i've got six years is what the what the family agreed to is to do this for six years, you know, I believe in term limits, you know, I will definitely self-impose because I got an awesome life I want to get back to. And uh, um, that's what, you, you've got an objective and when you when you transfer to from one command to the next, you know you've got a limited time there. And you're gonna take that piece of string and you're gonna pass it off as a rappel line and then pass it off as a hauser line. And, and uh, you know, uh, you're gonna have an objective at the end of that time that you're gonna be successful. You're gonna have made America better. And, and uh, that's not happening. That's a whole bunch of politicking and a whole bunch of saber rattling to get the next, uh, you know, election, you know, s- you know, spun up, fund, you know, funded and everything else. Um, yeah, finding that common ground and, and getting it done. Uh, if they weren't so worried about getting their next you know uh, seat in, uh, in Congress, the next term set up, they probably wouldn't be spending money and sprinkling it all over the place. You know, uh, making people happy with a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there. Hey, uh, you know, um, this party's trying to do that to you, and that party's trying to do this to you. Um, you know, when that's not true. You know, uh, uh, you know, definitely uh, these hot button. So topics you, you look at the mailers that come in you know um where we're they're, they're they're teaching hate you know uh and these are like mailers for different candidates up in maine yeah uh, uh, in maine everywhere, everywhere. you know we're, we're you know the the uh we even broach the subject because it's you get demonized you know uh, abortion you know on one side thinks it's a baby the other side thinks it's a woman's right and and basically um that topic is uh um either side thinks the other person's completely evil and and that's not the case each side was taught something different you know uh uh, you know republican women don't want to take away women's rights they're strong republican women and they they're strong they believe in women's rights but they, they also believe it's a baby you know, and uh, um, on the other side, they were taught something different. And uh, people are trying to make laws right now. They're saying they want to, but it's uh, it's not legal to make a law federally about it because it just got went. It has to go back through the Supreme Court. And uh, um, both sides are saying the other side's going to do something evil to your side. Well, no, you you actually can't. So why are you campaigning on it? You know, and uh, I mean, that's, I get, you will, th- this conversation is older, over, done. W- w- when I say, you know, my stance on it, and I'm pro-life, but I will not legislate on it. I'll vote no either way it comes to me. You know, it, it's, uh, I mean, us saying this on air right now is crazy questionable because there's some people that will just shut down, uh, um, shut down uh, on both sides. Uh, you know, because the people think I should take my position and use it to what they want. You know, but that's not constitutional. Mm-hmm. You know, so your your statement pisses everyone off. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So you got that going for so you. I got that going for you. But you know what? I'm honest about it. Uh, uh, and, and it's it's not constitutional. It belongs at the state. That's how the country gets along. Is we have all these little countries that unified and became a federal republic, and. Uh, uh, you know, there's different laws in in uh, Massachusetts and California and, and Maine, and, and uh, um, the people vote on them. The representatives, you know, uh, represent them, and that's how we get along. Otherwise, we would tear ourselves apart a long time ago. You know, and, and you know, we're, we're not going back to the '60s. You know, segregation. We're not. You know, uh, that gets, I get so much gets thrown at me, uh, and I'll, I'm just I'm just gonna be honest. You know. Um, it's uh, 
that hate, and I mean it's hate, uh, where they're, they're accusing um, one side or the other of, uh, you know, you know uh, taking away women's rights. That the other side just thinks it's a baby. Everybody knows it's life. It's just when it's become human life. And we go so far left and right of it, you know. Uh, um, there's only three countries in the world that, uh, um, that have late-term abortion, you know, China, North Korea, and America. And, and again, I don't care where anybody stands out. I don't hate anybody for their thought on it. I know that people have been taught different about it, you know, so <laughs> I have no idea if we should be going down this route. <laughs> Honestly, because uh, uh, it, it whew, it's crazy. Um, uh, I've been doing my lobster boat swims. Mm -hmm. Did I tell you about those? No, tell me about your lobster boat swims. My lobster <laughs> boat swims. So I'm swimming. Um, you know, uh, they have the lobster. They had a, a rally, a concert on the water. All the lobstermen come around, and uh, sixty degree water, and I got my campaign material in a, in a dry bag, and I'm swimming boat to boat, skinning it. And I'm, hey, I'm Ed Thielander, retired Navy SEAL, running for U.S. Congress. You mind if I come on board and tell you about the campaign? I hit 50 boats one day, like three and a half, four hours in the water. I did it five times. Um, swimming with the sharks. And in uh, uh, Harpswell, the, the great whites are out tearing seals apart. Mm -hmm. Not this one. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm campaigning boat to boat again. And, uh, you know, it's just neat. You're getting a lot of love. Uh, um, and... Uh, yeah, hit, hit the uh, news guy. Uh, he's on the float, and uh, I won't say what channel. I really want to, but uh, you go, hey, I'm Ed. You know, uh, and uh, oh, yeah, I know who you are. Uh, hey, great. I said, you know, uh, it'd be great to get on camera. No, I won't cover you. You know, th th that's a crazy wild thing too. You know, it never been done. Never has that been done before, mm -hmm. and uh, um, pretty disappointing. You know that that's yeah that's another crazy disappointing thing is, is uh, that that slant on it is is pretty tough. Well, that's a good way for people to keep their intellectual media uh, loop closed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just yeah. not going to put you on. Right. That's that. I'm not going to let anyone form their opinions about you because they're not right. going to know who you are. <laughs> Craziness. Oh yeah. Craziness. No. Um. So I mean, it seems like that that gets us to present day. We caught up right now. Pretty caught up, yeah, yeah. We're, we're uh, uh, running hard, you know. We're, we're uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I hit three, four events in a day, you know. I mean, I hit three event, four events uh, before I had my debate the other day, you know, just because I got to get the name out there. Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, uh, we're everywhere all the time, uh, you know, wife included, you know, a kid or two once in a while, and uh, just driving hard, you know, and seeing uh, you know, what what comes up. And you're down to the wire right now, huh? Yeah, we're down to the wire. Uh, got another forum or debate on Wednesday. It's a forum, I guess. We, they haven't given us the format yet. Uh, so that's coming. You know, th there's a, uh, a third-party candidate that just jumped in September 9th. Kind of can't figure that out yet. He's a write-in candidate that activates ranked choice voting. Um, so, yep, just vote Ed Thielander right across all three slots. Um, he's the love party. Love over violent empire. Well, I did say I love whales. Maybe I'm part of his his thing. Yeah, it, 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 it's rank choice voting. It's another crazy. What, what's thing. rank choice voting? Yeah. You, so you can put him in in order of rank. And yeah, like the top person gets it, three points or whatever. So if if uh, if I don't win by fifty one uh, percent, you know, over fifty percent, uh, then it goes by rank choice. So, you know, you choose one, two, and three, or you can just do one across for, for one candidate and, and kind of your ballots, you know, uh, doesn't give any points to the other people. How are the polls right now? The polls, uh, you know, it, the, the, the legit poll we have uh, is that we're out raising our three to one in main individual people, human donations. Okay. Uh, well, that's the a good the sign, other one right? is generic, uh, and it doesn't really take into account me because I'm, I'm still very unknown, even though we've been doing it for 14 months. It's amazing, you know, there's, there, there's you know, a district's you know, three quarters of a million people, Maine, smaller being, it, there's six, 680 plus thousand, you know, can't reach all those folks. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're out there, we're, we're in the places that, that 
Republicans don't dare to tread because, you know, they're coming on board. Um, you know, our first max donor was a far left Democrat and Democrats signing up uh, um, to, to help us out. To donate. Do, why do you think that is? Why do you think Democrats are signing up to help you out as a Republican? Because people are tired of what's going on. Uh, they they, they want to see change. They're, you know, tired and scared for the winter. You know, Maine is, uh, uh, we God, heat fuel six, prices is going to be crazy. Yeah, 60% of people in Maine heat with oil. And it's over double, almost triple what it was uh, last year uh, and, and going up. You know, um, that's going to, people are really going to choose between heat and eat. Um, and, and they were making that choice uh, before, you know. Uh, it's it's going to be a very tough winter. Um, people don't want to be dependent on the government, but it's kind of being forced on them right now, and that's wrong. We want, the Republicans, we want folks to be successful on their own. We help out, uh, um, but, man, it's, uh, it's opportunity and freedom, you know, uh, and responsibility, and uh, people want that. Maine is, you know, very independent, uh, it, it's uh, a ton of the voters, most of the uh, large in the state are independent. Um, and uh, they just want to be left alone. And, and uh, you know, nobody wants to pay taxes, but they do. And, and, and they want to work. You know, get people working again is what they want, too. Uh, a lot of things have been shut down. And, and uh, yeah, it's hard to find workers. You're experiencing that, you know, um, working on that. Found some folks that... Uh, been signing up for uh, some training by Echelon Front and a couple folks going to the musters mm -hmm. uh, as I'm, you know, going to the uh, um, these job fairs, you know, talking to the, the not only the students that, that are going to some of these high school uh, job fairs, but the employers too, you know. Uh, um, and I, I mentioned her, uh, earlier, uh, uh, I don't know if the camper was rolling, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the Republican National Committee, um, the executive director, uh, issues uh, the field manual <laughs> <laughs> for discipline equals freedom to everybody that comes on board. Uh, pretty wild, yeah. It, it's uh, but yeah, people are tired, people are scared, and, and uh, you know what's in power right now is, is influencing that. You know, yeah. whatever side you're on, uh, it, it's uh, it, it's it's time to make some change. If you want change, because you can't keep doing the same thing if things aren't going right, mm -hmm. you got to vote it in, mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, uh, I do reach across the aisle, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'm your, your, your typical Republican uh, conservative, you know, doesn't have purple hair. But I talk to them, get a ton of love off of everybody, you know, uh, uh, tattoos up to the eyeballs. I don't, you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody, you know, um, the, you know, cannabis, you know, uh, folks. Uh, medically, you know, uh, so on board with it. Recreationally, it's legal in Maine. Let's tax it and, and move forward and, and uh, protect the the. It, it's you know those folks are still buying stuff uh, uh, and uh, you know Republicans aren't normally about that. Now I'm stepping on the, over the line, telling everybody right now I am, uh, uh, and that's not you know the Republican standard. <laughs> uh, I, I'm willing to say, hey, you know. Uh, yeah, I wasn't. I've never tried it. You know, uh, I'm. You know, I'm not a heavy drinker. Not never tried any of that. Uh, uh, but medically, I know it's helped so many people. Um, and uh, you know, prescribing an 11 year old Adderall, not a good plan. Uh, you know, there's other alternatives out there, not addictive, that that can keep them focused and straight. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got to be so much smarter about that. So you, so you have d different viewpoints from the standard and you got an open mind thinking about what makes sense to you and not what the party line is. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, 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 a, that's it's, very scary, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it, it's the way I've really lived my life is how I got where I'm at. You know, uh, it's how I've got along, you know, from, from childhood to now. And, uh, that's what America needs. They need somebody that's going to problem solve and get along and, and say, Hey, you know, um, I made a mistake there. Uh, let's move forward. You know, and uh, you can't you can't not you know the OODA loop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, for anybody want to explain that? <laughs> Observe or orient yourself, decide and act, and then back to the beginning. Don't just keep moving forward. Yep. You know, small <clears throat> incremental decisions. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, but if you don't admit you, even two to 
two percent or a hundred percent got it wrong, uh, you're never going to improve and, and you know do what we did in the SEAL teams and, and make such an awesome machine. Our debriefs in the SEAL teams are brutal, brutal, uh, uh, and uh, they don't do that. You know, uh, well, I'm going to do that. You know, uh, I'm concerned about you know my own party. You know, and uh, uh, that, that I'm going to get along on a lot of things. We'll see. You know. Uh, um, you know, and everything I say, um, I'm willing to, yeah, check it out and see where, where it really is. Um, I mean, I've touched on subjects that, that uh, in this podcast that, meh, you know, uh, people are going to say, you know, crazy wackadoodle dude. Hey, you know what? I'm still willing to look at it and, and uh, make a decision, uh, maybe say I was wrong, you know, and, and move forward. Can't do it otherwise. Well, it's a refreshing attitude to hear. Where, where can people, if people want to support you? Thelanderforcongress.com. It's T H E L A N D E R for Congress.com. Four spelt out. And and if people want to see you uh, after you get done grading the church parking lot or driveway, <laughs> that's on Instagram. <laughs> yep, Facebook. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Thelander for Congress at Instagram, Twitter. You're Ed for Maine. Yeah. Uh, Facebook is Ed Thelander for Congress, and you have a YouTube channel as well. Yes, we do. Uh, Ed Thelander. <laughs> yeah. Echo, what do you got for questions? I have none. No I mean, questions. I had one about the, actually, you know, I'm, I'm Send asking. it, dude. So you. Uh, Come on, so dude, he needs practice. He's got yeah. a debate coming up. So you're gluten-free then? Yeah, uh, I'm a gluten-free keto kook. Wait, do you have celiac? Because you were having no. like celiac so symptoms. So I got tested for celiac, uh, uh, and no, um, not celiacs. Yeah, so just gluten intolerance. Just gluten intolerance, and now I'm a keto kook, and... and uh, when yeah. did you get on the keto program? Probably about four years ago now. Yeah. And, and, and you love it. Love it. Feel you know, great. Feeling great. I mean, everything's clear. Brain's clear. Joints are better. You know. Uh, How I mean, long did it take you to lose 70 pounds? Um, well, the first 25 was uh, when I went gluten-free. Another 50-ish um, was when I went keto. And that was, yeah, within a year and a half, easy. A uh, year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just it just came right off. And now you stay at two hundred five. I, I can go down if I want to. Um, easy. Um, I just don't want to buy any more suits. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> right on. That's all uh, I got. Yeah, I got a couple pictures in my suit. Uh, uh, in my, uh, the the white collared shirt I got. Yeah, that looks like your dad's shirt. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Ed, any closing thoughts before we shut it down? No, hey, um, hey, thanks for having me on. It's awesome. It's awesome to be able to get the word out, you know, and uh, hey, find that common ground. Let's move forward and uh, let's make, you know, uh, the best of, of, of our friendships. And uh, yeah, we will make things right. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on, obviously. Thanks for coming out. Uh, thanks for your service to the country, to the teams. Thank you for jumping into this mayhem that you're jumping into now. And uh, I wish you luck in the political arena. I, just the fact that you can come on here and, and explain that you have different viewpoints than maybe one side or the other side and you agree with some and you agree disagree with others, that's an open mind. And for me, I think that's what it's gonna take to get our country moving in the right direction. So thanks for what you're doing, bro, and thanks for coming on. Hey, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. And with that, Ed Thelander has left the building. Echo Charles. Yes, sir. Are you happy you're not running for political office yes. right now? Yes. Current, I am currently happy that I'm not currently running. You kind of had a look on your face during portions of that um, recording that you were kind of happy that you weren't yeah. running for. Yeah, we were um, talking beforehand. And, you know, you when, when you get into that arena, this mm-hmm. is what I gathered. When you mm-hmm. get into that arena, you see the curtain kind of gets pulled back and you see kind of how things work. And then you, so essentially you have a problem in there where it's like, hey, we need to change this. How are we going to change that? Well, you know, this system is set up to allow this, not necessarily for this, but it kind of allows for this. Well, okay, well, we'll change that then. Oh, well, but that system has to be voted on by the people who are benefiting from that system that allows this. And it's like, oh man, so, okay, what do you got to do then? Then you got to do this. And And it's like this big, like unraveling of a thing. Yeah. With like so many unintended consequences. And it's like, man, whew, it goes deep. And then that's that's on top of like the obvious stuff. I was like, wow, man. 
I'm glad you're running and not me right now. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> well, good on him. I'm glad we could get him out here um, because you know he's he's making an effort. He's and he's got a little. Uh, he's got like a pledge about taking ownership of what's going on, mm-hmm. which is sort of you know taking ownership and actively participating in what's happening with the country. Mm-hmm. I can't make that claim. You know, I'm attacking it from a different angle, which for me, the angle is trying to bring manufacturing back to America, trying to grow businesses, trying to improve our economy through that methodology. But as far as jumping into the arena like him, you know, respect. So good on him. Uh, I wonder what, because you know how like taking responsibility for a mistake, it kind of seems real obvious from the outside or maybe because just because you talk it all the time, so now it's Mm -hmm. obvious to me. But I wonder if there's like some weird mechanism in the political world behind the curtain that kind of like doesn't allow for that. You know, like the the obvious, not an obvious one, but the, the one that just hit me like right away was... Let's say I say something dumb mm-hmm. or I say something about something that or, or make a decision that's wrong or whatever. And I say, oh, I'm not like I made a, I made a mistake, you know, or whatever. Is it because everyone will attack them like in the media? You know how media outlets yep. have different yep. sides where they'll attack them and then be like, hey, uh, freaking Jocko finally uh, admits he was wrong. Fi- no, no, no. They'll say it way worse than oh, that. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll say, say it bad finally thing. confirms he's inadequate for this yeah. decision making type or something like this you know i think it may have something to do with do you remember at the muster yes. that we just went to there was a woman that asked it basically you know uh is it okay to say i'm sorry yeah yeah I remember. and you know like of course it's okay to say you know when you make a mistake you say sorry apologize for whatever mistake you made mm-hmm. but there's people like there's a whole leadership theory mm-hmm. that you never apologize right. yeah i've heard and that. You know, so I think the thing that we're talking about on the political side, I think there's something out there yeah. that's very similar. Never admit that you're hey, never admit that you're wrong. Right. Never apologize to, you know, the opponent. Yep. And you know, like to me it's the same thing. Yeah. You're just if you make a mistake, apologize. Yeah. Hey, this is a mistake. Here's here's what I thought was gonna happen, here's what actually happened. This is I was wrong about this, here's what I plan to adjust for next time, and I learned a good lesson that I can confirm will not happen again if I can prevent it at all. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's just that. I think it's just, and the other thing is nowadays, I mean, I guess it's not even that, just nowadays. Uh, what is it? Goebbels said that if you repeat a lie enough, it becomes the truth. Yeah, yeah. And so I think a lot of people are just like, eh, yeah. you know, I didn't say that. Yeah. No, I did not say that. You know, oh, um, you know, Jocko, it's a, you, do you, do you still, do you still uh, confirm the what you said last week about the blah blah blah? Mm-hmm. And I go, I did not say that. It was taken out of context. Right, right. But even though I did say it, yeah. You know, but you just said no. I didn't say that. It was taken out of context. In fact, that reporter has been known to take things out. You know, you just go <laughs> yeah. on there. In fact, yeah. my opponent has worked with that reporter in the past. That that's why they asked that question because they're actually you know nefarious in their activities. Yeah. So that's what everybody does. Everyone just denies, makes counter accusations tells the lie enough time that it becomes the truth and I think that's the standard operating procedure. And I think most people don't have time to pull the thread on it. I mean some of the presidential debates last year were just ridiculous like they're just they're just making accusations and then not yeah. even defending <laughs> but just making a counter accusation yeah. and just you know you said that blah blah you said that the economy would do this I never said that. You're like, what are you gonna do? Go look up the quote? No. So yeah. it just becomes two people just shouting at each other. Uh, it's it's horrible. The political thing is horrible right now. Uh, props to these guys that are these these guys that are stepping up and doing something about it. Good on you. Um, and that's where Ed's at. So good luck, Ed. I think he's gonna have a rough time. He's got he's got he's the problem. He's not a conformist. Yeah, you know he's not conforming to one side or the other side. Right, he's got one view over here, but he's got another view. He's got one conservative view, one liberal view. Yeah, do you think? Because you know when you watch it on TV, that's like the so. You know what happens? He gets shredded by both. That's what happens. Sorry yeah. for cutting you off, but only on because I don't know, I don't, I don't know everybody. Yeah, but I, it feels <laughs> like. <laughs> 
Yes, you know that I don't know. I, yes, yes. <laughs> but I feel like when you're kind of like an honest person who's like, oh, wait, like, I know I'm supposed to think this because I'm in this party, but like, man, I'm still, I'm still yeah. kind of like pumping the brakes a little bit before I go hard on it because I want to find out more. And oh, I'm sorry, I made that mistake. And hey, this is what I'm gonna do. Like, mm-hmm. this is how we're gonna fix this mistake. You know, like, you would think that your everyday American person would be like, hey, I think I like that guy. Yeah, I think I, I think I'd really, I don't know him that much, yeah. but you're, you're probably correct. And that the extreme people on either side will attack. Right, and, but it's the normal people, like, dude. Cut, cut him some slack. You know, he said something he didn't mean and he adjusted yeah. it. And then, the, but then they, at the same time, they watch the news who's like kind of like, I hate to use the cliche word fear mongering, but yeah. it's like they'll fear monger. You know, they'll be like, hey, wait, this guy freaking is already making mistakes or something yeah. like that. You know, like they'll put it in your head that this guy is unreliable because yeah. he made a mistake and he even admitted the thing. Like yeah, it's yeah. like he flagrantly made him. You know, it's like that kind of stuff. When it's like, bro, you framed that as like this kind of scary bad thing. When really most of us kind of think that's good. If you did, if this media, whoever, mm-hmm. the news, whatever, if they didn't say shit. Bro, we would have liked that guy. In fact, we would have need that. We need that kind of attitude, actually, you know? So it's like, man, we're all kind of getting washed up in the cyclone, you know? Yeah. At some point, someone's going to break through that has like a common sense attitude. That's what I felt, too. I was like, like, hey, you know, that's actually not true. No, you know, I said that, but I I made a mistake. And here's here's a more more, uh, holistic look at that issue. Yeah. So, and boom, you know, but, but again... If the if the out if the media outlet is against that person, they're only going to soundbite the negative thing yeah, all then day. That's not to mention, you know how they say, mm-hmm. and I don't know because obviously I'm not in politics at all. But they do say I've heard people are saying that if you go, let's say, you know, like um, like Tulsi, you know, had this happen to where she'll go in the I don't know Democratic Party, whatever. Mm-hmm. She'll go in and she'll start doing stuff that's like against, quote unquote, against the party. Then they'll get drummed out by the party itself. Yeah. And if they're playing that freaking like kill them game mm-hmm. or whatever, like they'll drum a person out who's like being all honest and stuff. Yeah. Well, Tulsi's a great example. <laughs> you know, yeah. she got crucified. Bro, so it's like this hard ass game to like to improve genuinely, you know. Yeah. Holy cow freaking i don't know it feels like yeah i th- i felt it though that i think you're right i think like slowly by slowly people are gonna be like wait how about let's actually like do the right thing yeah how about yep. like let's just try it you know a little bit you know some people are crazy too uh, <laughs> there's, there, there's like crazy people yes, there's sir. there's people yeah. that their their political beliefs are a religion and they're fanatical religious people fanatical po- political people mm-hmm. which to me is is if you're that focused, if you get emotionally upset about political things, mm. then I think you you should you you got issues, right? You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, there's I think people so. that get emotionally. And look, I can understand. You know, you get mad about something, or th- there's something that bothers you. Like, oh, that's you know, that's that shouldn't do it like that, right? Yeah. But if I'm going crazy about it, yeah, like even you heard me talking about uh, California, right? California has done so much dumb stuff in the last two years. And I'd be like, dude, are you kidding me right now? Yeah. But I didn't freak out. I didn't yeah. get on. That's another thing. If you're on social media and that's like a place where you're spending your time. Flipping out on Flipping out media. on people? What was it? I think I was on that podcast with Chris Williamson. Yeah. And he asked me something about, what was it? Like, how do you, you know. I think it was it was basically either how do you handle negative comments or something like this, mm-hmm. and I was like, bro, I mean, my recommendation is you don't spend a bunch of time being concerned about bots, yeah, bro. Yeah. They're bots. Yeah, I remember that was good. Huh? So, I think when you're politically outraged about something, because <laughs> because here's the other thing you got to remember. Outraged. Okay, if you're a lobsterman yeah. and you're about to have your you're about to have your your entire ability to provide for your family, yep. I can understand getting yep. outraged about that. Yes, I can. Too. I can understand being like, oh, you know what? I'm going to protest because they're about to take my livelihood away from me. Yeah. But there's a lot of things that people get emotional about that actually really aren't going to have an impact on their life. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Or it's like a hypothetical thing yeah. or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Also, too, like, um, 
And then I don't necessarily see people getting outraged about it, but but being like con- really concerned about it, mm. you know, on a personal level <laughs> is um, the one that does make sense to me is like the taxes and stuff where like when you know you're going to get less of your paycheck, that makes sense to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But yeah, well, wait, if you want to make if you want to get even more frustrated about that, once you realize that the government is taking a bunch of your money yeah. and then you see what they're doing with it. And you, and you say to yourself, wait a second, bro. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. hey, if you were building awesome bridges, you know, and the streets were clean, like yep. look at California. If you're like, hey, you know what, I pay a lot of tax in California, but look, yeah. look, look at Main Street, you know, Los Angeles. This beautiful place. But you're not saying that. You're yeah. literally, it's disgusting, <laughs> right? It's disgusting. And then they do other crazy things. Mm. So you could start to get a little spun up about that, but you know what you do then? You leave the state, which is what a lot of people have done. Yeah. How many people have, are leaving California? Yeah, A lot. Yeah, that should be an indicator. Yeah. And you could look at the federal taxes the same way. You're like, hey, look, I, I wanna pay for the security, I'm gonna pay for the military, right? Yeah. Hey, that's yeah. cool, to pay for some infrastructure. Yeah. I'm good with that. Yeah. But then when you start pulling the thread on those things, we should do a podcast where we just read through some of those expenditures. Oh, uh, It's yeah, yeah, insane. Yeah. It's yeah. totally insane what the government spends money on. Yeah. You can't make it up. If I tried to make up things right now for dumb stuff for the government to spend money on, I couldn't come close to the dumb stuff that they the actually stuff. spend money on. <laughs> the government yeah. spends money on the dumbest things. Damn. And, and yet, what are you gonna do? Well, you do your best to vote for people that want to tax less and that want to have a smaller government. Mm. Because big, the, the bigger the government doesn't become more efficient, doesn't yeah. solve more problems. Mm. Like when you're, going to, when you're doing a, an operation, you're going to, I had this conversation with Leif, Leif was like l- kind of in the learning mode. Mm-hmm. And you're taking down buildings. And you think, hey, I'll just put everyone in the building. But you can put so many in the built people in the building that they're kind of in the way. Now you gotta like hire someone, you gotta advance or promote someone to be in charge of the other group while they're in the building. And that means those two people gotta communicate, so you gotta put someone in charge. So you see what I'm saying? All of a sudden you got a bureaucracy in a in a in a kill house. <laughs> yes. We don't want that. No, we don't. That's like the big government problem. Yeah, you know, a sense. big assault force. Look, you need an assault force. You need to have enough people to handle the rooms and handle security. Cool. Yeah. I get it. But you can't just double that. Yeah and say, okay, now it's gonna be more efficient. It might not be more efficient. And if you triple it, you may have some real issues. Now now you have a problem. And now the problem is the assault force itself. You have a chance of creating a blue on blue because there's so many freaking assaulters going in. So the same thing happens with the government. I mean, here's, they just, well, this bill coming where there's 87,000 more IRS agents. I think it doubles the size of the IRS. Mm-hmm. That's too many assaulters in the room. You see what I'm saying? Like, there's too many. How, hey, if the tax code, they don't even know really what the tax code is. You know, I hire someone. I can't figure out what my taxes are. Mm-hmm. I can't even come close to figuring out what my taxes are. Mm-hmm. I have to hire someone who's got multiple people working for him that goes through and figures all that out because that's how complicated it is. Yeah. So I have to pay someone who also pays other people to figure out what I need to pay the government. Yeah. Why, it makes sense that if the government is gonna bill me for something, they just give me a bill and I pay it. Yeah. You know, I don't go into a restaurant, <laughs> order dinner, and I say, hey, uh, you know, how much do I owe you? And they say, well, figure it out. Yeah, here's a scale. You better weigh that rice. Yeah, that here's got. how much. You know, here's the cost of rice right now. And by the way, if you don't, if you don't come up with the right number, we're gonna have you arrested when you leave the the, the restaurant because you didn't pay the money that you owed us. Well, I don't know how much I owe you. Well, you better figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. What if you overpay the gov like your taxes and you like let's say you overpaid your yep. taxes. And you it rolls forward. It rolls forward. Do they do that automatically, though, or do you have to like say, "Hey, I overpaid," and then they do it? Uh, I'm not sure, but I know that my accountant, shout out Brandon, good to go, out, freaking awesome guy. Sometimes he tell he sends me a list like, "This is what you overpaid and yeah. how this has got rolled over." But I don't know if he didn't do that. Would they just be t- taking that money? Probably. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. So that would kind of make it uh, like officially unfair. Bro, it's officially unfair as it is. 
Yeah. Right? I think you're It's correct. officially unfair as it is. You are going to charge me. You want me to pay you money, but you won't tell me how much because I got to figure that out. And if yeah. I get it wrong, you're yeah, going to come you're arrest in trouble. me. Yeah, yeah. Damn. How's that work? How did you know I was wrong? Well, why don't you just tell me what that number was? <laughs> <laughs> right? I got to pay this other dude and yeah. his team to yeah. figure out how much money I owe you. And if I don't pay you the correct amount, you're going to arrest me, but you won't tell me what that number was. Yeah. That's, that's some crazy brutal. talk. That's brutal. You wouldn't yeah. think that that made any sense whatsoever. And yet that's how it works. It makes very little sense. And now sense. we got to hire 87,000 more people. 87,000. By the way, when you hire 87,000 people at the government, you d- when you get government federal jobs like that, that's a lifetime of pay. That's, mm. that's retirement pay. That's health insurance for the rest of all these people's lives. It's health insurance for their families. It's a crazy deal. It's not like you hired a, a number, a small number of people and they're gonna do some extra work and when they're done with that extra work, they're gonna move on and find another job. No, this is a, you're, you're hiring someone for their life. Yeah. That's what a federal job is. So these aren't like small budgetary additions. These are, these are a total change a paradigm shift in the size of this tax collecting organization. And that's the best you can do. Everything is digital now, and the best you can do is hire 87,000 more people to, to help us figure this out. Are you kidding me right now? So you wanna, you wanna talk about stuff that can get you crazy, that's one of them, yeah, that but, but nonetheless, I'm talking about it right now with you. I've never talked about this with you, and I'm, I don't, I know when I go home, I'm not gonna be like fuming about it, right? Yeah. There's issues that people get spun up about. And, and by the way, what I just talked about, that's a pretty serious issue. Mm-hmm. They're taking money that you worked for, and they're taking it from you, and they're spending on things that don't make any sense. Mm-hmm. That's, that, if there's one thing that could piss you off, that's definitely in the top seven. I agree, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I mean, would you be mad if I went in, got into your car, took your wallet out, took your money, and left? Would you be <laughs> mad? What if I only took 50% of your money? Yeah. Would you be mad? I would be mad, yes. And, but what if I bought you dinner? With your money, but I also kind of bought me dinner too. <laughs> so, so people taking your money is definitely one of the top things that can be annoying to you yeah. and can piss you off. Yeah. The government does that all the time. Yeah. So if there's, but that's the top seven, definitely in the top seven of things that can piss you off, people stealing from you. Yeah. Hey, look, it's, only, it's not stealing up to a certain point because when, when the government takes money and they spend it on things that, you know, help. Hey, okay, we're gonna have a good military. We're gonna have good infrastructure. We're gonna have some reserve, you know, fuel in case something goes. Hey, I'm in support of those things. Yeah. Cool, I got it. Yep. But that hits a limit. The government doesn't need 51 percent of my money to do that. Yeah. Doesn't. But they're taking it. They're spending on some other shit. Some yeah. some shit that I don't. Uh, you know, that is not right. Don't so that's where we end up. Proof of. Yeah. But anyways, you guys were talking about the O course, how you can't just go in there anymore. Mm-hmm. You think you could do the O course uh, right now? Yeah, hundred percent. Would you get a good? What do you? What do you guys time it or something? Yeah, like no, this? it's definitely timed. No, I probably wouldn't get a great score because there's some technique that I'd be rusty on. Is there a minimum you got to make or something? Can you fail the O course? You can definitely fail okay. the O course. Would you fail the O course? No, course? I would pass. You pass it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> would I yeah. pass it? I would need to teach it to you for two days, and yeah. then you'd pass it. Oh no shit! Yeah, if you're if you're athletic, like you, if you can do pull ups, push ups, dips, and you can run, you're gonna yeah. be okay. It's a, I tell you what, that O course is awesome. Yeah. When you get done with that thing, you're smoked. Oh, it's hard. It's like oh a good, yeah, solid. Dude, oh, How yeah. long does it take? Yeah. Give it roughly seven minutes. Oh damn! Seven minutes of putting out. <laughs> seven minutes of putting out hard. Like you know, uh, you know the. Mm. The taste in your mouth, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the, the I just put out real hard. What is it like a copper taste in oh, your yeah, mouth? Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You get that hundred percent. Oh, for real. Even if you're kind of chilling, like let's say, let's say you and I went out there weekend. You know, we're in the teams and we just go out there. Yeah. We're still gonna feel it yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But when you go hard because you're trying to pass because you're in buds, bro, yeah. you feel that shit. It's big time. <laughs> big time. I always liked the expression "putting out." Yeah. I don't think I ever heard that till. I- hung around you guys or whatever check cool well speaking of putting out you got it you got to fuel yes the output yes i'm not gonna gonna recommend you do that with some clean fuel yeah the cleanest fuel jocko fuel it's true (laughs) physical (laughs) mental integrity 
Like these are all important things. So when you fuel that, you, you fuel need, your integrity. How'd you throw that one in there? I got no, no, physical. No. I got mental. No, no, you no. tossed integrity. Bra, 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 bra. No, 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 no. What I'm saying like you is, you got a kid, and they're not. They're, your kid's lying in school. We give them some Jocko <laughs> fuel, but tighten up tells his the integrity. Truth. Yep, <laughs> tells the truth. It's true. No, Hell bro. Yeah. When you're putting out is what I'm saying. I'm gonna make a new supplement called Integrity. Maybe you should. Let's do it. All right, there all you right. go. Book it. Put it on the the books or whatever the expression is you guys use. Anyway, yes. When you fuel that output. When you're putting out all that stuff, <laughs> you want the supplements with integrity. You know what integrity means? Supplements, that's something. Okay, energy, for example, energy drink. Mm-hmm. I'm explaining to you like you don't know, even though I do know that you do know. Energy drink usually has sugar, caf- uh, uh, preservatives, you know, poison. Right. Jocko Fuel does not no, have that. Clean. Only healthy stuff, clean, clean stuff. Yeah, integrity, that's what I mean, exactly what I'm talking about. Same thing with the malt, protein shakes, protein mix, and RTD, no mm. sugar. Sweetened with fruit, not even like a, a sucrose or fructose monk. or actual monk fruit. Monk, monk fruit, so good. So good. Uh, yeah, so check that. Actually, on the way down, you heard the keto. What, what did, how did Ed describe himself? Keto. Keto kook. Keto kook. I said, hey man, you want one of these drinks? He goes, oh, I can't, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm a keto kook. And I was like, we're good. Yep, good to go. He said, there's no sugar in there? I said, no, there's no sugar. It's sweetened with monk fruit. Yep. And he was like, oh, cool. Crack one open. Keto kook getting after. Keto kook getting after. Uh, keto kook approved. Yep. Integrity. Actually says, what does it say? It says something on the can about keto. Keto friendly, maybe? Yep. Anyways. So there you go. Yep. Get Regardless. yourself some Jocko Fuel. JockoFuel.com. Go to Wawa. Go clear the shelves at Wawa. That's what you got to do. Clear the shelves at Wawa. Just go go in there to buy them all. That that will help the campaign to grow. Because people look at Wawa and they say, "Oh, it's doing really well in Wawa. Cool." So if you want to help, if you want to help the campaign of growth, go to Wawa. Clear the shelves. Vitamin Shop. Pink Mist is at the Vitamin Shop. Pink, Pink Mist has kind of been a big hit. Have yeah. you noticed that across the board? I, I had one today, and it's it's good. It's one of those like if you go to like it's it's. It's kind of what do you call it when it's safe, you know? Mm, Where it's like safe. you can't go wrong. You can't yeah. go wrong with that one. Oh well, that's how you feel. A lot of yes. feel people. A lot of people feel that's the one. Oh no, that's, that's not the, the one. top of the list. No, well, that's because you one. like that mango. Mango's one. the one by far, my opinion. But I'm with it. I'm with the whole gig. Jogglefield.com, OriginUSA.com. So, okay, so Ed from Maine. One of the problems up in Maine is got to grow the economy. So if you want to help grow the economy in Maine. Go to originusa.com and you're gonna find blue jeans that were made in America, that are made in America, Je- uh, boots that, that are made in America, jujitsu gis that are made in America. We also have another factory down in North Carolina as well. So American made is what we're doing at originusa.com. Go and get yourself some American made gear and help America, help manufacturing in America. That's what we're doing. We appreciate you helping us to do it and you doing it too. Boom. It's true. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. Where you can get your Discipline Equals Freedom shirts and hats and hoodies and stuff. Also, we have the Shirt Locker, which is a subscription shirt every month. Cool designs. No more days where you don't know what shirt to wear. (laughs) You got one. Don't you normally say it's a subscription situation? It is a subscription situation, 100%. <laughs> whether I say it or not, it's true. JockoStore.com, that's where you get get the stuff. Check it out if you want something, get something. Uh, JockoUnderground.com, go check that out. We're putting out podcasts on that, and it's also a little uh, safe zone. Sure. What is that? Safe space. Yes. That's what it is. Yeah. We're safe in there. They can't take it away from us. That's true. It's kind of not the, the typical term, safe mm-hmm. space. No. It's, it's an not. atypical term. But I know that freedom of speech is safe yes. inside jockounderground.com. Go check that out. YouTube, check out that. Uh, you want to see some awesome videos that I have uh, assistantly directed. Assistant <laughs> directed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. YouTube, Psychological yeah. Warfare, Flipside Canvas, bunch of books. You know what they are. I've written a bunch of books. Echelon Front, leadership consulting company. We solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com for details. Just got done with the muster. 
down in Atlanta. It was an awesome event. And you know what? It was sold out. And everything we do sells out. So if you want to come to one of our events live, go to ashlonfront.com and check out the events. We also have the online training academy. So if you want to learn these principles and you want to train these principles for your business and for your life, go to extremeownership.com. And if you want to help service members, active and retired, you want to help gold star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. If you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And also check out Micah Fink and Heroes and Horses, taking vets into the field where they can get lost and there they will become found. Once again, thanks to Ed Thielander for coming on the show and to follow him or check out what he's got going on, thelanderforcongress.com. The Instagram is Thelander for Congress. The Twitter is Ed for Maine. Facebook, Ed Thielander for Congress. And YouTube, Ed Thielander. And if you want to hang out with me and Echo online in the in the zone, right? Sure. <laughs> in the interwebs. Yeah. We're on there too. Echo's at Echo Charles. I'm at Jocko Willing. Just just be careful because the algorithm's there. And it's not it's not for your friend. No. It's pretending to be your friend. It's going, hey, look at this. Like it's saying no, that to you. Yes, hey, it look is. at this. It's going to show you something. <laughs> and it's something you want to see. Yeah. Well, it's something that your most base form wants to see. Yeah. You don't want to see it. You want to be disciplined. You want to carry on with your life. You want to go execute on awesomeness. But instead, the algorithms got you like an octopus. I think we need an octopus algorithm t shirt. <laughs> Bunch of different things trying to tie you up. So there you go. Thanks once again to Ed for coming out, sharing your lessons, and thanks for your service to the teams and your continued service to America. And speaking of service, I want to say thanks to all of our military, active duty and retired, every branch, every rank out there. Thank you for protecting our freedom and our way of life. And thanks to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all First responders, thank you for protecting us here at home. And everyone else out there, since we were talking about Maine, I'm going to go ahead and close with some more of the great Joshua Chamberlain. Quote, we can hold our spirits and our bodies so pure and high, we may cherish such thoughts and such ideals and dream such dreams to lofty purpose that we can determine and know what manner of men we will be. And that's right. End quote. We can determine what manner of men we will be. And we become that man by taking action. So, in the parlance of our time, get out there and get after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.